Vice Chair Baldwin. Thank you, Catherine. I mean, uh, Karen. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> J.C. Baldwin, um, representing the general public, Vice Chair of the Public Works Board. Um, mem thank you, J.C. Member Martin did excuse himself today. Um, Member Scott. Good morning. My name is Mark Scott, um, Andre PUD Water System Manager. I'm representing PUDs. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, Senator Haugen. I don't believe she's here yet. Um, Member Pottinger. Yes, I am. Oh, you are. Good morning, Mayor Margaret. <laughs> Good morning. I hadn't had my, all my little buttons pushed yet. Uh, Mayor oh, Margaret Haugen, representing the general public. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Um, Di Member Di Pottinger. Hi, Diane Pottinger, District Manager, North City Water District, representing water and sewer districts for the great state of Washington. Good morning. Um, Member Carter. Okay, one of the buttons wasn't working. Uh, Pam <laughs> Carter, Commissioner, Valley View Sewer District, um, representing sewer and water districts. Good morning. Um, Mark Dorsey. Yes, uh, Mark Dorsey, Public Works Director, City Engineer for the City of Port Orchard, representing AWC City Public Works. Good morning. Member Anderson. Good morning, my name is Geraldine Anderson. I am Redmond City Council, also representing AWC and all cities in the state of Washington. Good morning. Um, Member Trask. Good morning, Sharon Trask here, Mason County Commissioner representing counties. Good morning. Um, Member Rowe. Uh, good morning, uh, Gary Rowe from Mariston Island representing the general public. Good morning. And Member Delvin uh, indicated he'd be absent today. Um, Member Stern. Morning, Executive Director Burkholz, Ed Stern, Paulsbo City Council, along with Dr. Anderson representing cities and the Association of Washington City's Board of Directors. Welcome and cool hat. Um, very cool. Uh, let's move on to the staff team. Uh, Karen Burkholz, Executive Director. Cindy. Uh, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Sydney should, Sydney should have public works team. Good morning. Connie? Good morning. Connie Rivera, the program director for public works board. Jason? Jason Fries, uh, board communications. Good morning. And Sheila? Good morning. Sheila Richardson, public works board team. And Ellen? Ellen? Hello, Ellen Hadleberg, Public Works Board team. Good morning, Ellen. And board, um, on behalf of the team, myself, uh, everyone who she's interacted with, I wanted to say a huge thank you to Ellen for her service to the Public Works Board. Um, her last day with us is next Thursday. Um, she accepted a promotional opportunity within the Department of Commerce uh, in the Housing Division. And um, she will be around to help us push out the next board packet and get things up and running for our August 6th meeting. I just wanted to let you all know that I'm very happy for Ellen. Um, I'm very sad that she's going to be leaving us. Um, she's been such an integral part of my work and my life as your, as your executive director. Um, I wish her all the best, but we'll miss her like crazy. Um, so that was my little announcement for you all. And we'll move on then to the other attendees. Mark Barkley. Mark Barkley, Assistant Director of the Local Government Division. Good morning. Chris McCord. Yeah, Chris McCord, Department of Commerce, Managing Director for the Board's Year. Sandra Adix. Good morning. Sandra Adix, Assistant Attorney General. Good morning. Um, Dawn, are you with us yet? Eichner? She will be joining us later. Is there anyone else who'd like to introduce themselves? Uh, this is Dave Dunn from Department of Ecology. Hello, y'all. Good morning, Dave. Recording in progress.
Anyone else? Good morning, Mara Michelski, contract lobbyist. Good morning, Mara. Anyone else? We do have quorum, uh, Chair Gardo. We can proceed. Great, thanks so much. And welcome everybody. Um, after our amazing June meeting, um, where we got to thank our board members, we got to meet with legislators. This month is um, a little bit of a respite, but still lots of work to go towards um, as we will be preparing our decision packages that will go to the governor for the next um, session's uh, budget. So um, I'd like to thank everybody again for an amazing meeting in June. I guess I haven't had the opportunity to say that um, in public except when we had the meeting, but still uh, when we had the uh, the thank yous for all the board members and thank you board members that uh, are still with us. Um, even though we did say our thanks in June, I'm really appreciative of all you being here today. Uh, we have lots to do. I do know from Karen, which she'll report on later, the status of what's going on with uh, replacements, but they haven't happened yet. So thank you for being here. And then just having the associations be their um, last board meeting to talk about the work that uh, they would like to see us do and how we work together with our associations and then having the legislators there. Um, and I got some nice notes from those who are not able to, to make the event, um, Senator Wellman and Senator Frocht uh, specifically, um, but just an amazing, amazing event. So uh, appreciate all of you for that. So let's move on to our consent agenda. Um, so we have on the consent agenda, today's agenda, um, and then also approval of the June 4th meeting minutes. Does anybody uh, want to make a motion towards that? Chair Gardo, I would like to move that we approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Second. We have a... Uh, a first and a second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Uh, and the consent agenda is approved. So uh, next on our agenda is public comment. Is there anybody here that would like to uh, make any public comment? And I hadn't been queued up that there is anybody who wants to make public comment. So I'm not expecting anybody, but just wanting to have that opportunity here. All right, let's move on then. So um, the next item on the agenda is our public disclosure. I see uh, that uh, there is most likely a, at least one public disclosure uh, that needs to be made. Um, and it's uh, for the Port Orchard emergency funding request. Um, are there any others? And would the person who, uh, our board member who's uh, from Port Orchard um, be willing to speak on that? Um, I will be recusing myself for item, business item 3C. Great. Are there any other recusals that we need to know about? I don't think so. Okay, so let's uh, move on to item three, which is the discussion of our traditional program and member Trask and uh, um, Ms. Riviera, if you would please take it away. Thank you, Chair Gardo. Um, our committee is, is still rocking it. I mean, we're, we're doing an amazing job. Um, we have two worthy projects that we're bringing to, uh, before you. Um, but first, before we get to those projects, I would really like to thank the committee members for their time and energy and also for staff. They are amazing. So we could not do our job well if we didn't have the amazing staff that we have. Connie, would you take it over from here, please? Good morning. And um, thank you. It's like, wow, we went through the beginning of the agenda rather quickly. <laughs> Caught me off guard. Um, 
the, our Chair Gardo had asked me to provide an update on um, where we're at on our applications that we have received so far. And the status is I'm proud to announce that um, it keeps growing is the application cycle closes tonight at midnight. We have um, 91 applications started, 37 have been submitted. And the, the request so far looks like it's um, around um, 250 million. So um, Jason and I will be downloading the applications tomorrow so that we can get ready for reviewing um, next in the next couple of weeks so we can present this um, to the board at their August meeting. So very exciting. The first item I would like to talk about is the um, extension request from East Wenatchee, and it's on page 17 of your board packet. Is East Wenatchee is a pre-construction -con pre um, contract um, that was awarded in uh, 2018. Is um, this is our second request? The first request was approved um, in. Um, July um, of 2020, and at that time, the reason they the for the request was that um, they were at that time they were like 90% completed with the design, but then they received some additional uh, funding that ex uh, expanded uh, within that project, and so th then this caused um, more um, adjustments they had to do in their design work. The board approved that, like I said, on July uh, 9, 2020, and um, it was extended to March 31st of 2021. They, um, I had been working with them for the closeout of this um, contract, and then they notified me on May 26, 2021, that they needed to request another um, project completion extension. And this delay was due to that they submitted their bid package to WashDOP. Uh, local programs for approval in November of 2020, and they didn't receive their approval until March 8th of 2021. So this comes into line as the their contract originally was expiring March 31st, 2021. Um, their bids came in on the 30th, and, and now they're requesting an extension to go to July 31st, 2021. So that way they can... Um, ask for a reimbursement for the effort of um, the work that's being done between April and July. And they have about roughly 120,000 left in the contract. Questions? Thank you, Connie, uh, for an excellent report. Uh, yes, are there any questions on um, what Connie has presented? Would somebody like to make a motion to extend this contract? Chair Gardo, this is JC. I'm happy to make that motion. Thank and you. I'll, and I'll second it, it's Diane. Thank you, thank you so much. All in, favors of ex all in favor of extending this contract, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any nays? Motion passes, thanks so much, Connie. And so we'll move on to Port Orchard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Gardo. Um, the city of Port Orchard has um, come to the board asking for a half million dollar emergency loan to um, facilitate making necessary repairs to their pottery lift station. Um, in May of 2021, while uh, City Public Works Department staff were doing their scheduled maintenance of the lift station. Um, they observed um, extensive corrosion caused by rapid exposure to hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, this creates a risk of failure in the lift station, which would result in um, the potential of sewage being expelled into an area that not only has a public middle school, but also a very large apartment complex near it. Uh, this would create a risk to public health and safety. Um, and so they would like 
they would like the board to approve a half million dollar loan so that they can make the necessary repairs, which would include recre uh, replacing the corroded and failing piping within the lift station, installing an air scrubbing system for odor gas control, which should uh, make sure that the uh, sulfide gas problem is taken care of, and also install corrosion resisting uh, coating to the system to inhibit any further corrosion. Um, <clears throat> the city believes that completing this project will ensure efficient and effective operation of the lift station over the next 30 years. Um, this project qualifies under our emergency construction program guidelines um, as a, an emergent threat to public health and safety due to unforeseen or unavoidable circumstances. This would be <clears throat> the first loan of the new biennium out of the emergency account. The emergency account balance today is $5 million. Um, so if this is approved, the remaining balance would be for uh, $4,500,000. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I can only imagine that that would be quite the surprise uh, to go into the lift station and find that level of, of damage having been done. Um, are there any questions of Jason or perhaps of Mark? Um, perhaps he has seen uh, this, um, This I imagine you've seen this lift station, uh, Mark. I think Mark's off the call right now. Oh, he left totally, okay, okay. Does anybody have any questions of Jason? I'd like to make a motion. Okay, please. I make a motion that we accept this uh, request. Second. Would somebody it. like to second it? I'll make second. a second, Chair. Are they uh, ready to uh, call the question then? All those in Chair favor Gardo, say aye. Uh, just a moment, yeah. I heard two seconds. Could we clarify please who the second oh, was? I, I heard Gary I, and I, I heard Ed. Ed's oh, I heard to... Ed, I didn't hear Gary. Um, Ed, Ed's fine. It's okay. fine, okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Gary. No problem. I guess that's the hard part about being not being in person. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Okay, motion Chair, carries. Chair Cardo, I have a follow-up question for staff. Uh, just as a curiosity, um, we, did, at the biennium, do we start with a new balance in the, for emergency account? Does any of it roll over from the previous biennium? I'd be happy to answer that. Um, this kind of is um, we expended all of our emergency funding in the last biennium. The last award was made to the town of Malden, and the board authorized, um, I think, a month ago so ago or two months ago, the um, budget set aside a $5 million um, for emergency for this next biennium. So it's first come first serve on eligible projects. And so on the bottom of the memo, it has that, I believe it has set 5 million. So this half million will, will be awarded and the remaining balance will be 4.5 million available for future projects. Thanks, Connie. You're welcome, thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's move on to our broadband program. And I will say that um, I had the opportunity to- uh, I don't read. think we voted. I don't think we voted. Oh, did we not? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, thank you, Mary Margaret. Um, I thought we did vote. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the emergency loan for city of Port Orchard, I'll say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries. Thank you, Mary Margaret. Um, so I was gonna say that I've had, had the opportunity to, in preparing for this meeting, to read the after action review and um, that uh, Sheila had prepared. And it is an amazingly comprehensive document. If you hadn't had the opportunity to read it and you wanna know what's going on in broadband, I highly recommend it. Sheila did an amazing job. And with that, I also wanted to thank the, uh, the broadband committee for the amazing job they've done. I have I've felt 
behind a little bit behind the eight ball in understanding broadband issues, even though I know something about them, but it, it is extremely uh, uh, detailed uh, and uh, so much work has been done. So I really want to uh, thank uh, Chair Baldwin for the, all, all the work that she did. And then also uh, the, her committee members and, and of course, Sheila, uh, totally appreciate it. So with that, uh, Chair Baldwin and Sheila, would you please uh, take it away? Thank you, Chair Gardo. And I wanna echo your compliments to Sheila. What an amazing, um, what amazing work she's produced. So thank you so much, Sheila. And um, a definite shout out to uh, uh, member Gary Rowe, Ed Stern, and, uh, and Eric Martin um, as board members for the work they've done on this as well. Um, it is hard to get your arms around a brand new program. And um, and this group with, um, with Sheila's support has just um, done a really great job with that. So uh, with that, I won't, I won't take up or the board's time and turn it right over to Sheila for the review. Um, Sheila Richardson, um, and thank you very much for your kind words. Um, the committee has been working on, um, of course, preparing the items for um, the board meeting, the bid set aside, the privacy policy, and also um, we've been putting in a, um, a lot of work on looking at opening a federal funding cycle and a state loan funding cycle. Um, so that pretty much summarizes, uh, oh, and legislative concepts for next session, we've started working on that. So that, that summarizes our, our committee work. And um, just, just a few things about the after action review. Um, I don't know, Ellen, can you, can you show the slide for that? Sorry, which slide do you want? Um, the 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 flow chart for the after action review. Uh, give me one moment. Okay, no problem. Um, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, following the first. Uh, grant and loan funding cycle, we began the process of the after action review. Um, and the purpose was to evaluate what was supposed to happen, what actually happened and looking at why there were differences. Um, the goal was to identify those issues that needed to be changed and also to create a continuous culture of gathering stakeholder feedback that lead to program improvements. Um, during the after action review process, we had input from over 100 stakeholders. Um, we, did, we did this data collection through surveys, debriefings, um, um, our lobbyists, um, continuous engagement in roundtable meetings. Um, from, from the process, we identified about 42 items that, that, need, um, that need to be assessed and, and action items for change. Of the 42, seven of those items were flagged for possible statutory modifications. The report being recommended to the board is, um, as Madam Chair said, a comprehensive study of those findings and efforts to date. And, um, we have the, the flow chart of the after action review process up on the screen. Does anybody have any questions about the report being recommended to the board? So I, I have one question, Sheila, and it's more of a curiosity rather than, uh, but I, I thought it was interesting when you said you added two questions to better understand why somebody would accept a loan. Um, and do you remember, you may not remember this, but why, do you remember what the questions are? I, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, um, so, so the issue surrounding that was um, when the awards were made, we didn't know what, what the um, applicants level of, of uh, or percentage of loan dollars that they're willing to, to accept. Um, 
they they had done most of them have done their own financial analysis and they knew that point at which they would not accept an award based on a certain percentage of loan and knowing that up front um, is would be really helpful in in being able to um, to look at that and um, and go to the next person on the list without having to go through the process of um, it, sending out the, the award letter and then waiting for a response and then going to the next person. Um, knowing that up front would be very helpful for, for um, and save a lot of time. So I don't know if that completely explained it, but. So, so are there, because I know this has been a big question, are there jurisdictions willing to take loans to do broadband? Because I've been hearing, uh, and of course people, it, we all like to have things done for free uh, their tax dollars, obviously, of course, they're not, it's not uh, free in the sense that nobody pays for them, but they're tax dollars. But what, what, uh, what types of jurisdictions are willing to take loans or are there jurisdictions willing to take loans? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, you, you get a lot of different responses from, from different people and there's, there's no one type, you know, it's all situational. Um, we, we did hear from, um, you know, WIDA and some, some PUD stakeholders and, you know, some of them have, have, um, indicated that they already have access to, to low interest rate loans and that if these areas would be funded, they would have been, you know, served already by low interest rate loans. And, and then there were others who gave us feedback that there are ways of, um, crowdfunding and whatnot, where where they can accept a certain amount of loan dollars and and have um, end users have skin in the game, so to speak. So there there's a you know there's there's not a one size that fits all. It's it's you know there's no rule of thumb for that. Are there any other questions of the board from Sheila on this uh, this document, or especially also from the committee? if there's anything they feel that the board members should know uh, from this document. This is Gary. Please, Gary. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first off, I wanna say we've, we started working on this pro process uh, last fall. So it's taken a, a fair amount of time. And I think that the staff, including Shelly, uh, uh, previously with the uh, Public Works Board and, and Buck as well, provide a lot of input uh, in, uh, in the process. Uh, so it's been a thorough review. Um, there are, as, as you mentioned about the, the loans, that's a, a continuing um, issue that we'll continue to look work at. But with that said, I think that the, this has been, from my perspective as a, as a committee member, this has been a pretty comprehensive look at every all the issues and, uh, and, and the report, I think, does a good job of uh, covering everything we've talked about. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for all the work that you did on it. I know I, I saw at some point in time you you did a, a review of the the document to to make sure it was all ship shaped. So appreciate your help on that too. Any other comments from uh, board members or uh, Karen? Please. I just wanted to add um, my thanks to uh, the broadband team and the committee, uh, and their agreeing to pursue this after action review uh, because you know it's a methodology that was sort of new um, to us. But I think that it is an important methodology because it inserts a, a mechanic, if you will, of, of continuous improvement and quality assurance, quality control. Um, so that the next time that we do a funding cycle, we again will revisit what worked well, what didn't work well, what stands for improvement. And thus we're always progressing and becoming better. Um, and I think that the dialogue with our stakeholders, I cannot thank them enough for their engagement with the team and with the uh, committee members to make sure that their voices and their perspectives were heard. Um, that was a very critical, important point of this after action review. And so my thanks to all the stakeholders who did engage with us in this process. Thanks, Gerardo. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. Yeah, I know, and we get to have the excitement. Uh, I think we're maybe opening a funding cycle around broadband. So, hey. <laughs> so um, I see um, that it, this is a, are there any more comments or uh, on the after action review or questions or 
uh, things that folks would like to say. And I, I, I assume that we need to adopt this. Is that correct, um, Sheila, as a, a board action? Okay. okay. Chair Goddard, I move approval yes, of the action, after action review report um, from the on broadband. Thank you, Gary. And uh, it comes from a, a good person to say that. Who would like to second that? Sharon Trask, I'll second. Great, thank you, Sharon. Okay, uh, any more questions on this? Any more discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. nays? Thank you, thank you all. Uh, motion passes for a job well done and congratulations to all. And we have an amazing tool to go forward with this, uh, with uh, this broadband program that we do. So thank you, thank you. So uh, bid set aside policy. I see that, uh, is it Connie that's coming, talking about this? Um, yes, thank you, Chair Gardo. Is um, today I'm presenting the uh, proposed broadband bids set aside account policy. Um, as the board members may recall, uh, last month we um, adopted the traditional program um, bid set aside policy. This policy is for broadband is to mirror the similar um, background and um, methodology as traditional is uh, due to the pandemic, the country has seen increased costs in construction materials and demand of materials exceeding availability. And this is really true with the broadband as well as I know that Sheila has reported out to the board is with the increased federal infrastructure funding av available throughout the United States, um, the demand for this limited supply of construction materials increasing is uh, the board had approved for the traditional a maximum set aside up to 500,000 um, per request as long as they meet the procedures are outlined in the board memo and this starts on page 40 and 41. And um, talking to the committee is we have a couple of different funding sources in broadband for this biennium. We have our state um, funds, which is loan and we have our federal funding, which is grants, is um, recommended um, per you know our um, accounting is that we need to keep those funding sources separate, and so we cannot commingle funds in the same project. It just makes it easier for the board in managing our um, due diligence, and then also the. Um, potential applicant of dealing with their accounting on these um, type of funding requests. So I would like to talk about first is the state funding. I'm asking for two different set aside um, accounts. The state funding is loans. That's the only thing that's available to us for this um, biennium is uh, we had um, in the memo, we have um, 7 million was appropriated for this first year of the fiscal year. And then we have a remaining balance of a little over $6 million from the last biennium. So it's a total of 13 million in the account. The committee recommended a 10% set aside, which would equal $1.3 million um, for the max amount. And we, this is kind of like seed money to get this one started. It's the difference with traditional. The policy is the obligations of uh, loans is what goes into that account. Um, with broadband just starting, um, it needs the upfront uh, funding in there. Is the same same thing holds true for the state um, funding bid side? So, I can't talk. Bid set aside is five hundred thousand. The interest rate for this funding for those loans would be based on the interest that was awarded to them on their original contract. This is really, I think, important to have this account set up for um, the applicants that received loans in um, October of 2020 is they're just getting started with their contract and their construction. And so that was kind of like the middle of the pandemic. And so their um, budgets might not have been um, built for the cost of inflation due to the increased demand of supply. 
The second um, account is the federal funding. And the bid set aside um, we're recommending or the committee has recommended is not to exceed $2 million. So this would come off of the top of the total federal funds um, available. And so in the memo, it talks about we were awarded $46 million um, and that I lost my place. Uh, Forty-six million dollars, and oh, I guess it's in my other memo. We have um, administration dollars is set aside at six ninety, so we have available. Then we'll be talking about when we open the cycle. It'll be around forty-three million dollars. So if the board wanted to choose something differently, then this will definitely be a domino to the next action item, and we would still continue with the federal funding set aside. Um, of 500,000 per request. We're hoping with um, the federal dollars that we might not need, or hopefully um, the applicants won't need the increased funding is part of the process of opening up the cycle. We'll be educating and providing a webinar and talking about, please build a, a good budget that has the contingency and anticipation of delay of materials. And with that, um, I, I think I'll pause here and ask if there's any questions. There's a lot of information here. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much, Connie. Um, and I would propose that we, um, uh, as we go through this, with we adopt them um, separately, uh, doing one as the state uh, motion and then one as the federal motion rather than combining them. So I have one question and then I'll open it up to the floor. How did you pick a half a million dollars and what are the costs of many of the, the contracts or you know, what, are the, what are the requests that the, the broadband has, you know, their, their proposals when they came in? Isn't it only, aren't there a maximum of $2 million um, dollars for, um, and then $5 million for tribes? Oh, for, um, sure. Um, is it silent in the board memo? It talks about we can't exceed the maximum of the statute for the ward. So uh, projects that are in rural um, counties or Indian country, the maximum they can receive is $5 million. So um, then for the non-distress um, counties, then can receive up to $2 million. And so there are set, I think there's seven um, applicants that did not receive the maximum award. And so we can exceed that. And then um, how we chose the 500,000, this mirrors traditional program is that when I brought it to the board last month is our set aside was 300,000 and it mirrored the Department of Health um, drinking water um, uh, state revolving fund program and they had increased theirs as well just due to the demand so the, the half a million or 500,000 is to mirror with DOH and with traditional. I just didn't know if we could compare you know health department of health and our pro other and traditional programs with broadband I don't know enough about the economics between them so that's part of my question. Uh, I don't think we know either. This is, we just opened our cycle last year and this year, and I think it will be an anomaly as we see things coming see. through. And I, you know, I believe we could work with the committee if we wind up seeing something differently. Um, I don't know if we really have much data to. Um, okay. Okay. So it was a little more of a, just based on other things rather than data, letting us know half a million was, the, Correct. The, what the bid overruns could be. Correct. So, We're just trying you. to be consistent. I see. Okay. Thank you. Um, so please, are there questions from the board of uh, Connie on these proposals? Yeah, Catherine, this is JC. I had my, um, had my hand raised. So Connie, just Oh, something. sorry. You know, I'm not seeing people. I'm sorry. It's, that's, I don't know why. Okay. It's all right. I, I very rarely raise my hand. I usually just barge right in. I was trying. Yeah, to please phone. jump in. I'm not seeing the only person <laughs> I see is myself. And so that's not very good. So 
Um, so Connie, my, my, just a quick question. So I'm sure. trying to get more clarification on exactly what the five hundred thousand dollars is for. So is it is it admin costs? No, no. Good question. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, um, okay. It's been a long week. Is the uh, five hundred thousand is for when um, at the time that they do their application, they anticipate what their uh, construction costs or what that would be, and so it's time of application. And then when they go out to bid, then they could have that uh, the bids come in higher than it, they had anticipated in their application for. Um, um, funding of the construction so if they didn't build it in a healthy enough contingency and so in the process it says that the um, applicant will be, need to um, submit to us their bid documents and then we will want to make sure that the bids exceed the original engineer's estimate contained within the original public works board um, program application and so um, it's only for the increase of bids is not cost overruns. It's just at that point of when they submit their application, what the cost was going to be, and then the time of bids. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, it does. So Thank it's, you. It's a, it's a buffer, basically, uh, in the event of cost overruns, which I get. That. And, I, and I certainly understand. I know in their report district, we we're seeing just the cost for mobilization on projects doubling right right now. So that's that. This is the kind of thing that would help with that. Those contingent costs. Correct. Thank you. So now I have my. I see you all now. So I see Pam Carter's um, hand is up. Please. Okay. Thank you. I want to. I, I have some other questions, but first I want to follow up on JC's. Um, question and response. As I understand it, this is not for cost overruns. This is only for bids that come in higher and it does not cover scope creep, creep. correct? Um, that is correct. I said it did not include cost overruns. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, the first thing when, when uh, Connie was presenting this, uh, she said that the it's recommended to separate the federal and state funding into separate accounts. So I assume she meant that we have different, we treat them differently is the recommendation. When does the board um, have the opportunity to vote on that recommendation? It is um, silent by being presenting two different set aside accounts. One is state fund and one is federal funding. Okay, respectfully, the board is the one that's in charge and something this is new, I think, <laughs> accepting federal money with, with different reasons for, for treating it separately, but that seems like that should be a board decision because the board is the governing authority. Um, I, I agree and respectfully, I'm going by with the state auditors um, so because we still have to be in compliance with state auditors. And so, um, yes, if you would like to add a uh, motion to um, keep them separately in the support of the state audit guidance, that's perfectly, would be good. Okay, so what are the different, so I don't know why and how they are different. You said one major reason is a state auditor. That sounds like a really good reason, but it seems like there must be differences in, I don't know, the parameters, how the money is used or, or something like that. What are the differences? It, it, it's the coding. St state dollars is has to be tracked in one set of pot of money as state, and there is... Um, local governments have barcodes uh, that is reflected as state auditor says you shall um, identify your funding this way. We have to do the same thing at the board working through commerce on our budget. So state is was coded as state dollars, federal funds are coded as federal dollars. And we try not to commingle the two funding sources in one project. It makes it easier for um, accounting 
because when we do year end, um, we have to give notifications for federal funding. You have to give notifications to your clients as to how much federal funding they have drawn. So this is to keep accounting um, clear between the two funding sources. Does that oh, Okay, so there's no other reasons. There's not any um, ways that uh, the parameters and what the money spent on or what an applicant has to do as far as reporting there there's no differences at all it's no difference on the um as to how it's being spent it's more for their financials and for um, commerce's financials their financials whose financials the applicant so if you if your district was to receive federal dollars and it's federal dollars, then you have to code it a certain way so it's in your financials of your revenue for the for your auditors. And then if you were to receive state dollars, then you divide you identify how much state funding you received in your financials for the district to give an example. Okay, so there, there's no other um, requirements for wages or materials or anything like that. You, you can tell I've never administered a contract, but I just know I've heard things about um, wages or, or sources of, of materials and things coming in sometimes. So that's why I'm asking, I'm trying to clarify if there's, if there's absolutely any difference in other than just the, the accounting, the coding of things. For this policy, it's just for the coding is um, when I go into the next um, presentation for the um, federal funding, there are um, requirements, federal requirements for federal dollars, and I'll briefly go over those if you like when I present that. And so you were talking about wages. So wages, there is an issue. Um, you have to do Davis-Bacon, and I can cover that. Um, oh, okay, so there are differences. So we're, it seems like we're doing this backwards. We're being asked to um, um, take actions to establish set aside separately for state and federal when we haven't acted to separate the two. I, I, we're doing it it backwards. I'm, I'm not, I'm not quibbling with what we're doing. I just think we should approve them doing a federal and a state and have that briefing before we do the set aside accounts that are separate. That's up to Thank the you, board. Pam. Okay, I, I have um, something else that well i thought i did let me see my notes here <laughs> um oh in the memo the draft policies that you have there's four bullets for state funding and two for the federal funding and so are we not and they're not included in the wording that's up on our screen um, but for federal funding, we aren't going to talk about the interest rates. Correct, because it's all grant. There's no okay. loan in federal. Okay, see, I didn't understand that either because this is all new. It's the first time we've had this. So that's why there's, okay, the federal is all grants. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Pam. Good questions. Thank you, Connie. I, I had seen uh, Mark Barkley, his hand had been raised and I saw Gary Rowe's hand raised. I didn't know if you had any, uh, if you wanted to jump in on anything there or not. Um, no, thank you, Chair. I think it was covered. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm fine as and well. And JC, your hand is still raised. Are you still just raising your hand and not. No, I, I told you I'm not very good at this. <laughs> I'll take it down right now. I, Thank you, I'll Catherine. take it as a high five rather than raising <laughs> yeah. your hand. 
I'll, I'll just give you a quick high five there. There we um, go. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> okay. No worries. Yes, Gary, please. Yeah, Chair Gardo, I would uh, move approval of the bid set aside of $1.3 million for the state uh, funding. Um, you said you wanted these to do separately also, I'll leave it. Yeah, at and, and, and you can include the amount also, but I would just, because they're two separate accounts, um, I would suggest that we do them as two separate items uh, just to keep it clean. And then we, uh, then in the future, if we're taking action on state funding versus federal funding, they're, they're always just separate. And I, I understand that, you know, federal funding oftentimes, and one of the things we just learned um, with Pam's questions is federal funding oftentimes has other, other uh, what do you call it, other strings attached. So sure. I just, just think it'd before, be cleaner. Before we get a second, just to, uh, that motion includes uh, lim limiting the bed, bed set aside up to 500,000. Perfect, thank you. Do I have a second on Gary's motion? I'll second that, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Member Stern. Are there any questions on uh, the bid set aside of 1.3 million uh, loan bid set aside? I think it's important that it's loan for the state funding with uh, maximum up to half a million dollars. If um, not, uh, oh, please. I have, a, I have a question. So with the state money, we're only going to do loans and no grants. Uh, That's required by that statute. is what this says. Yes, and we are. We do have. Uh, we do have grant. Yes, I think that's correct. Yep, it, yep. it is to. correct. There's no grant funding available for state funded. It's all been I we, allocated. I think we had we had 14 million in loan funds. Uh, Given to given to us by the legislature is that all state money then, Connie? It's all state money. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that clarification. So yes, Pam. Did you have a follow-on, Pam, at all? Uh, well, just an explanation. I'm going to vote no on on these act these not because I oppose what's being presented, but because I feel it's wrong to approve when we haven't already authorized separate um, the separation of the state funding and the federal funding. Actually, it was given to us by the legislature that way. It wasn't authorized that way. It was given to us, the legislature, when they gave us the money um, at the end of April or whenever it was, was given to us that way. So, um, but that's fine. Um, okay. And so it, I'm finding it very confusing. I, I don't understand the fine details that you do, and this hasn't been presented to the board to do this separate accounting and run separate loan cycles. And um, I just think that that's wrong. The board needs to be involved in these decisions rather than staff making them. It was actually the legislature that decided that for us. It wasn't staff making that um, decision on how the money would be separated. But that's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just add this was um, staff presented this to the broadband uh, committee, and they're the ones that recommend us bringing this forward. So this has been worked through the broadband committee. I appreciate that. Appreciate the broadband committee for doing that too. Uh, that's always helpful. So we have a motion on the table for 1.3 million for the bid set aside account for. Uh, the state funding that would be in loans with up to a half a million dollars uh, being re allowed to be requested. Uh, may I have a vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. nays? Aye. Nay. And any abstentions? Okay. Um, I think we have it there. And Gary, please. Uh, Chair Gardo, I'd like to make a motion to set the bid set aside, set aside for the federal funding at $2 million with a maximum of $500,000. Please, may I have a JC. Thank you, JC. So we have a first and a second for a $2 million grant set aside funding account uh, with federal funding with uh, the set aside uh, being allowed up to um, or not this, uh, with a client being able to request up to a half a million dollars. Um, do I have an, any more discussion? And hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any nays? Nay. Thank you. And any abstentions? All right, the motion carries. Thanks so much. Thanks for all your work on this. And again, thank you to the broadband committee for your work on this also. And I do know how uh, prices have been increasing because <laughs> I had a little project in my front yard and it went was a lot more expensive than I initially expected it to be uh, based on the bid. So. Um, so financial information data policy. I see this is um, Sheila, please. Thank you, oh. Madam Chair. The first yes. and the second, oh, just a second, Sheila. Uh, Ellen, the first and the second was Gary Rowe uh, on the second one with JC being the second. Um, can I ask, and I know Gary Rowe on the first one was the um, the first, and who was this, was it Ed? Were you the second on the first motion there? The first motion, remember. Yes, Chair on Bardo the second, was. I was first. The first one for uh, state. Thank okay. You. It was Gary and Ed, and then it was Gary and JC. Yes, great, yes. Thank you, Ellen. I'm sorry, Sheila, you're on now, you're totally on. Yeah, no problem. Um, during the two, uh, 2020 cycle, grant and loan cycle process, the privates and um, tribes raised concerns about public disclosure and the protection of financial data. Um, the PWB's RCW is not included in the statute that, that Commerce and CURB uses to protect financial data. Um, so going forward, um, what we've done is we've removed the, the financial questions from the application and that has been moved as, as part of the post-award um, conditional award process. The committee wants to recommend a policy for requesting financial data necessary for the underwriting to be submitted no later than 30 days from the day the board awards funding. Um, additionally, committee intends to seek statutory modifications for um, RCW 42.56.270 to be included in that statute to protect um, private data um, of all applicants. So are, so are there any questions about the recommendation to set a policy um, that applicants have no later than 30 days from the date the board awards funding to provide that financial information? So just to be clear, Sheila, the first piece is to change um, and we have the authority to be able to do this, correct? Under the RCW. And the second is a recommendation for a policy decision that you just talked about, or policy uh, that we would take to the legislature this uh, next session. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that part of it's just kind of an FYI of what we're going to okay. do going forward. But what's on the table today is um, a recommended policy for uh, giving applicants that 30 days um, post award process to provide that information to us. And we need that information because of statute or we need it because of being able to figure out the loan information? Yeah, um, not necessarily statute, but for the underwriting process. Okay, okay. In, a, in awarding applicants. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Uh, does anybody have any questions of Sheila? Uh, Pam, please. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make sure. Um, right. No, I have a question on this one. So, will are you concerned that this might have an effect? Um, I'm thinking back to the after action report where, or somewhere that I've read, where um, people drop off and then you have to go down to the next one. Do you have any concerns that um, while you're doing the underwriting that you will find people who really aren't able to handle the loan or whatever, and so then you have to move down to the next applicant um, on the list? So that's always a possibility. 
I mean, that's that's the purpose of of underwriting is is to make sure that the that the awardee can can assume um, that obligation. However, um, this isn't going to change much from the last cycle because the underwriting was done after the fact during the last cycle. This just takes those financial questions out of the application and then sets that 30 day period after the board awards funds. So it'll still still be done after the fact. It's just we're not going to ask those questions up front in the application to keep, um, keep it out of the application. So, so I think I understand you. I just want to restate it to make sure that I'm interpreting your words correctly, because I think they were fr- pretty clear that okay. normally the application would have had these questions in it, but you really wouldn't have utilized that information until after you had decided um, whether they qualified, whether they were on the list for awards. And so now um, it makes no no difference as to when the information is being utilized by staff. Yes, you you have that correct. Okay, thank you. I'm happy now. Good. Thank you for the clarification and thank you for asking the question because uh, now I am clearer too. So thank you, Pam. Are there any other questions of Sheila on this, um, this proposal? Would somebody like to make a motion to recommend this? Chair Goddard, this is JC. I I'm recommend. Like motion. Oh, sorry, uh, Ed, second. I didn't mean to talk. Thank you. Uh, we got sorry, JC Ed. is a first and Ed is a second. We have a standing ovation from JC and I. <laughs> we need to let JC get as many firsts in as possible since she's going to be I probably leaving won't be the at board. the next meeting, right? I know, JC. Oh, gosh, I'm going to miss you so much. Um, I'll miss everyone. But, so we have a first from JC and a second from Ed. Um, any other uh, discussion or questions? Pam, is your hand still up from last time? I, I think it is, yep. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. Okay, all those in favor of this uh, recommended uh, motion, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. Okay, and then we have, da, 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 da. I feel like I'm the Valkyries here as the Valkyries come in because we're going to have a, the opening of a construction cycle. Yay! <laughs> So please, Connie, if we are we are ready for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited too. It's like, oh my gosh. It's 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 great to have money, isn't it? <laughs> so I am um the next item that I'm presenting is requesting to open up the um, 2021 broadband construction funding cycle with federal funding. And I will apologize to the committee. I noticed this says staff recommendation, but it was presented to the broadband committee and it's their recommendation as well is the federal dollars. I'm gonna go kind of through the background is that um, as Chair Gardo had stated, the legislator legislators appropriated 46 million in federal funding from the coronavirus capital projects account less and then less allowed administrative costs for deployment of the broadband program and we heard from when we had the legislators our champions at a previous meeting that represent Theringer really encouraged and supported us to open the cycle and get this the money dollars money out the door and so um with that being said, is we are recommending to use the interim rule for the coronavirus that state and local fiscal recovery funds. This is not what we've received as appropriation, but it is um, identified as uh, funding for broadband. And so it's um, been discussed with the legislators and um, and others involved is um, to be consistent is we've been looking at their um, interim rule to develop this program and the federal requirements that goes with that hand in hand is um, when we open up this cycle in our program guidelines it will state this is a conditional award 
Um, and, and I know this is premature because I haven't gone through the background, but I just want to let you know we're putting everything we can in the guidelines to um, protect the board and for the applicants that it's conditional and there are federal requirements. We'll be educating um, everyone and on webinars and in our guidelines. Is that with that being said, is um, our we're allowed to take up to 1.5% for administration. I'm going back to the 46 million for providing 690,000 to administer the program through December 31st, 2026. Again, this is in the rule of saying when the funds have to be expended. Um, the board, this is the reason I went to the board earlier to do the set aside so I would know how much would be available for opening up the cycle. Um, the board has moved to approve a $2 million grant bid set aside policy. And so what's remaining to open the cycle will be 43,310,000 for qualified broadband construction projects. Our, our guidance is in this memo, it talks about it costs will incur at the time of award and um, to December 31st, 2024, and awardees must expend all funds for the financial obligation incurred by December 31st of 2026. Yesterday, um, we are have created a group where we're talking about federal guidance and it was brought to the attention yesterday, and this memo was done um, a week ago, that we're actually allowed to fund a project that's already started um, as of March um, 3rd of 2021. And so that is a change in this memo. The uh, focus on the dollars is to provide capital broadband uh, projects are directly enabled work, educate health monitoring, including remote options in response to public health and emergency. All projects must demonstrate that they meet a critical connectivity needs highlighted, amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's in the federal guidelines. The program application highlights is um, we I've worked with our, um, our attorney general, Sandra Adix, and just talking about is the federal, when you have federal and state, and you have a state statute, federal requirements um, right are higher than our state statute. So wherever the federal requirements are silent, then elements in our broadband statute prevail. So in this case, um, we are recommending that we open the 80 day open um, grant cycle. And this will include the statutory requirement of notifying the um, um, internet uh, providers that were the applicants planning on building this area. So they still have to follow that process about six weeks prior to submitting the application. What's new in here is eligible applicants for um, the federal funding is local governments, tribes, and special purpose districts. They can partner then with nonprofits and internet uh, service providers. And so that's different from our statute. And then due to um, the requirements of the federal funding to make sure this is being built fully is applicants must have a committed internet service provider or providers. Um, and that that's been added to the application for them to identify those individuals. So we wanna make sure that we get a full project and meet the federal guidelines. On the next page on page 44, is we are following um, the Public Works Board statute that the non-distress um, counties can receive up to $2 million and that the rural counties um, and the Indian country applicants that are identified by the WAC may receive up to $5 million. Is I wanna make note that um, we found out yesterday that the federal dollars does not require match. So they override the board's statue. So no match will be required for this uh, federal grant funding. We will, will also uh, incorporate the objection process that comes from our statute. And so here in this timeline is we're showing that um, the objection process will start on October 4th and the board will make awards in their November board meeting. 
And those, again, we're hoping between this 80-day open cycle, they will get more guidance from the um, federal treasury. And um, we will adapt those in our um, awards or our recommendations to the board in November. We will keep um, applicants posted if things change. And um, I was going to say the... So anyways, we're hoping that when we do open this, or award the projects in November, that we'll have all the guidelines and everything um, in hand. If not, then we'll be coming to the board for only as conditional awards and no contracts will be um, signed until we have all the official um, information from the federal treasury or the office of financial management, because the funding is going through them and they will be directing us on um, different um, compliance things we may need to adhere to. As Pam had asked me, you know, talk a little bit about the federal um, requirements is, um, and I'll just briefly go over a list and I'm more than happy to meet with any of the board members to help them understand what these different things are. We will be building these federal requirements in our uh, broadband policy handbook, which will be done between now and um, November is receiving federal dollars, you're required a single, um, you possibly could be required to have a single audit. This means that you receive 750,000 or you know you spend 750,000 in a calendar year. And so this is the, uh, the wardy. Um, Davis-Bacon may apply. It means that you pay the higher uh, federal state prevailing wage. Um, Part of the audit is you must um, prepare financial statements. The applicant does to clearly identify what their federal funds have been spent within um, that calendar year compared to the award. Mm -hmm. There will be some quarterly uh, reporting requirements is um, that's very specific in the federal guidelines. And I've been working with um, Sheila and Jason, and then um, talking with the committee is we've built in the baseline of getting more information in the application so that when Sheila does have to do the quarterly reports, she'll have the baseline from the applicants. And this is dealing with connections and the speeds and that type of thing. Um, to, in order to receive federal funding, um, staff will be making sure the applicant and all the identified ISPs are not um, uh, suspended or debarred from receiving federal funds. And so we'll be verifying on the federal website that information. Uh, some of the highlights then uh, professional service engineering requires competitive proposals and construction requires um, sealed bids. So those are some of the highlighted ones that are in our application guidelines. And I think wow. I'll pause there because that's a lot of information, but I was <laughs> hearing what Pam wanted to say. So I was trying to uh, help educate. This is the beginning. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you, Connie. This is uh, a lot. So I see that uh, member Rowe and then member Stern have questions, please. Yeah, so um, one of the issues that Connie brought up was the requirements, uh, match requirements for this particular federal program. And she stated there's no match requirements in, in we anticipate there's no match requirements in the, this particular fund, funding based on the guidance they have for the, uh, the coronavirus relief funds. But I think it's important for this board to take action specifically, include action, to set the, set the um, match at zero because it, under statute, we have a, the authority to go up to 90%. We're not using the statute for this particular reason, but since there's no specific requirement or, or lack of requirement either way, I think it's for, for, important for the board to set this at zero so it can't be undone um, without board taking action at some point in the future. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Mr. Stern, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And when we're done with item 4E, if I could reserve a moment not specific to federal construction cycle for a comment on the broadband program. Uh, specific to 4E, I would just like to get clarification on something touched on briefly at broadband committee uh, two weeks ago. I missed due to a medical procedure yesterday explaining my high styling cap uh, this yesterday. Mike, question or clarification for Sheila 
uh, understanding that there is a massive influx of broadband federal and state dollars, not only here in the state of Washington, but throughout the country and understanding supply chain for materials necessary to undertake these projects and supply and demand governing uh, all of these activities where we might experience cost overruns unanticipated or corollary uh, time elements being stretched out. How much flexibility do we have within the, uh, the uh, program cycle for finishing these programs to account for those kinds of difficulties, which we should in fact anticipate? And that's for me. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. Um, I know we have, we have a very long window of an open cycle to allow time to gather more information um, as far as federal guidelines. Um, what can, can you, can you tell me exactly what your question is? Yeah, I apologize for, uh, over, overstating that. Uh, Sheila, what I'm seeking is the fact that not only here in the state of Washington will applicants be seeking material to complete projects on broadband, but across the other 49 states simultaneously because of what's happening replicated across the country under the rescue plan, where, we in, where applicants might encounter unavoidable delays. How much flexibility do we have for cost overruns and o or for time overruns that are unavoidable? Well, we had the bid set aside that was presented earlier. And um, also I think that underlines the importance of um, getting this cycle open and out there and is as early of a start on this as we can knowing that there's gonna be all these other funding sources um, happening. So I don't know if Connie or Karen would like to chime in on that. I'm sure, oh. Sheila, is um, the way I forgot to mention is that the we're still honoring that a project is to complete it within four years. That meets the time frame that's outlined on the federal guidelines saying that um, they have until 2026 to complete the fund. So that's the reason it's really important is to open the cycle because oh. we're eating into that time frame. And so hopefully there will you know the four years will be enough um the like sheila just said the bid set aside is not for cost overruns it's for just at the time of applications submittal of what construction is going to cost and then when they receive their bids is um we will be providing a webinar when we open the cycle like two weeks after if the board chooses to open the cycle and to help start educating um, the applicants as to the requirements and looking at the timing and everything. And we really want to have them um, add, build healthy budgets so that um, they make sure they have enough ability to um, complete a project with the new demands with materials across the United States. Does that help? Yes, and my remark is also intended, Connie, for the board in general to be sensitive that there's only so much fiber to go around, let alone the ancillary equipment to support either end of the fiber. And it's going to get very tight out there for a period of time and supply and demand prices will go up. So I see that. Um, thank you, Ed. I see that Karen has the question and then uh, Pam. Um, and then we need to be mindful of time here um, as we still have a, an item before our break, a couple items. So please, Pam, or yep, please, Pam. I thought you were calling on um, Karen first. Karen put her hand down, so now you're oh. up. <laughs> okay, I wasn't watching that. Um, yes, thank you. The presentation, um, cleared up some questions I had scrawled in the margins as I read the memo. Um, but I think it's really um, important that the board, since this is new money coming into us, a different kind of thing than we've ever had before, it totally makes sense to have a separate loan cycle, or not loan cycle, <laughs> a, federal, a, a funding cycle 
to utilize this money. Um, but I think that can't happen unless we authorize um, having a separate funding program. Um, so I would like to move that we approve a new separate broadband funding program to utilize these federal funds. So that's my motion. Is that uh, different than opening up the broadband construction federal grant funding cycle that's proposed? That to me, that's a first step before we before we can authorize opening uh, opening up a funding cycle for a program that we haven't authorized. We need to authorize having this separate program. Okay. Uh, okay. Do, do is there a second to that? I'll second that. Okay. So uh, should we have discussion on that then, please? Gary, please. Yeah, I guess uh, you've made the comment earlier that the legislature basically established the program for us. I'm not sure whether the board needs to take action on what the legislature's already done. That's a reasonable comment. Thank you. Um, is there any more discussion on this? Uh, my, my question is, they gave us the money. Did they establish for us a separate, um, separate program? You know, Pam, I'll just make a comment on this. I mean, maybe we need to hear from Sandra Adix on this, um, but I personally, um, I don't see the need here myself, but um, maybe there's other people who do see a need. So maybe Sandra can at least give us a- Yeah, Sandra could, could help. Yeah, because I mean, I think by implication um, through the legislation that the program is established, but to Pam's point, I mean, I see no harm in the board formally taking an act, action, acknowledging um, that there is in fact this separate federally funded broadband program. Um, you know, it's at the board's pleasure. I don't see any harm in Pam's motion, but I also agree it probably is not strictly necessary. So sorry for such a uh, wishy-washy answer. But <laughs> and and maybe it's because I haven't memorized the, the legislative wording and nothing's been, you know, presented this time so that I don't have as deep an understanding. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, jump to Mark. Oh, excuse me. For, for clarity, the board can acknowledge that there is, in fact, um, a, a separate federally funded program. So I'm, because we're running tight on time, I'm going to jump to Mark Dorsey and then we'll call the question. So I, please, Mark. I just wanted to clarify with Sandra that the board could, but it seems like it's redundant. Right, so it's up to the board what it wants to Thank do. You. Okay, so I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor of the board establishing a new program that's been authorized by the legislature, uh, please say aye. 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 All those against? Aye, nay. Nay. So I think the ayes have it, unless uh, any abstentions. Can you call for an individual vote, please? So why don't we have uh, everybody raise their, you know, <laughs> why don't we walk through it here? Can yes. I call the names, Chair Gardo? Please, please. Um, Vice Chair Baldwin? Nay. Uh, just a, um, Member Scott? Aye. Mary Margaret, Member Hogan. Aye. Member Pottinger. Aye. Member Carter. Aye. Member Dorsey. Nay. Member Anderson. Aye. Uh, Member Trask. Aye. Member Rowe. Aye. 
Member Stern. Aye. The ayes carry. Thank you so much. So we have established the program. Um, and please, Gary, you have a uh, your hand raised. Yeah, so I have a question for Connie. Um, earlier in the discussion, I brought up the whether or not the board should take action to set the um, Did you get your matches. Hand it's not there. I didn't. Mary Margaret, could you mute yourself, please? Excuse me. Uh, so I was asking Connie whether or not um, she would be opposed to the board taking action to set the uh, match at zero percent uh, um, based on guidance we were we're following. So oh, let's... that is fine. Um, um, okay, so I'm I'm going to yeah. follow up with a motion then, if you don't mind. If you could, I have just one, uh, two questions, and then we will be ready for your motion, uh, Gary. Um, one is, uh, will during this cycle, as fe if federal guidance comes out, would it be added to the information? Um, is that what the proposal is? I mean, I would imagine it would be. And is, do we have any anticipation on when federal guidance could come out? We don't have anticipation. We know that um, OFM has submitted or will be spending their plan to the federal um, treasury. And I haven't heard any updates on that. Um, we hope that it would happen by time in November is as okay. you know, um, um, the curb has already opened up their cycle and they'll be awarding um, next um, at their next board meeting. And so they are following the same interim rules that we are following. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mark, please. Yeah, we believe uh, <coughs> uh, it's our guesstimate somewhere in August, September timeframe, we'll see that guidance. Okay, and then just the question <coughs> on your timeline, Connie, that I saw, um, are you able to turn around those um, awards and you had you have it November 3rd and then on November 5th you have awards uh, what does it take between November 3rd to November 5th the um it, it's just a time the objection process ends on November 3rd because you're required 30 days before right. the board awards um, also, in this time period, staff will be reviewing the um, applications, which this time period is actually a lot longer than traditional. Traditional has two weeks to review. Right now, it looks like 100 applications. And so this will be um, a, a month for reviewing applications. So you have a and, month to review applications, and then you find out if somebody objected on November 2nd, it, they just get crossed off the list that you would bring to the board? Is that what... I, I would um, defer to Sheila. Is the board has a policy on that? Sheila, did you want to answer that question? So, so the the awards are always conditional, and um, the the objection period is that thirty days. It it can um, take longer than that to resolve. So so once that project area that's that's um, being awarded. Is 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 seen as um, no valid objection? Then then the award letter can go out. I see. Okay. Okay. So please, uh, Member Rowe. Thank you. Um, I move for the board to uh, open the broadband construction with federal grants funding, so, uh, starting July fourteenth and uh, ending on October twenty first. Uh, October first, excuse me, uh, with a additional provision that uh, the match for federal grants be set at 0%. Do I have a second on that, please? Second, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Was that a second, Ed? That is correct. Okay, great. Are there any questions um, or any discussion? If not, we can call the question here. All those in favor of uh, Member Rose's um, uh, motion to open the broadband cycle for 80 days beginning July 14th with a 0% zero per, zero percent match to close on October 1st, say aye. 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 Any nays? 
the motion carries. Woohoo! I feel like, as I said, the Valkyries just arrived. If you don't know who the Valkyries are, it, that's the ring, and that's when the, the horses arrive. So <laughs> you may not be into opera, though. Not that I'm totally into opera, but it is an exciting piece of music. So, yes, and I see some hand clapping from Sharon. So thank you. Okay. Um, we are running about five minutes late. Ed, please. Oh, yes, you had something you want to raise. Ed, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and please excuse the chirping. My fire alarm battery went out in the course of this meeting, and it's 22 feet above my head in this office. So my hat and the chirping, I apologize for. Uh, just the thought to share out loud with both the Public Works Board colleagues and staff here at Commerce. Uh, Based on the very successful model of the legislative authorized sync uh, coordinating uh, group uh, for traditional infrastructure, uh, I'm wondering uh, in order to uh, more effectively operate this brand new and very large broadband construction cycle, my thinking out loud is, would it be worth pursuing with all the entities involved with sync creating a subcommittee specifically don't, uh, devoted to or focused on broadband uh, so that all the parties are there at the table and not just the usual suspects of CURB, Public Works Board and State Broadband Office, but also Department of Transportation and others that are also involved in broadband so that there's more focus during this through 2026 period of intensity. Um, I'm thinking that might really further coordination and collaboration, separate from anything we might do on an MOU level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank I you, Ed. Just that. Uh, please, uh, uh, Number one, um, Member Stern, that effort is already underway. The uh, legislature, when it extended the life of SYNC, added broadband as a subject area. And so that's likely going to already be happening. So I want you to know that um, and that we are working on the hows of that with our partners and the partners include Ecology Health, all the existing SYNC partners, as well as the, the broadband office and CURB. Uh, also on the secondary front, there is a monthly coordination meeting that happens now between the broadband office, PWB and CURB. Um, that has been actually on the books for some time, um, and uh, but that's underway as well. Um, so those coordination efforts are definitely um, noted and necessary. Uh, the third thing is, is that uh, when the budget proviso was enacted for the broadband office, it called for uh, coordination between the three broadband infrastructure programs, which are curb. PWB and the SBO, and uh, specifically around the process to maximize the investments going towards broadband um, so that those are happening in a coordinated way. And the process for that is led by the broadband office, um, and they will be embarking upon that um, once they're fully staffed up. And uh, Don will be here uh, joining us at their new deputy director um, for a panel discussion on broadband um, this morning still. And also that calls for the possibility of an MOU between the three parties to make sure that that process is um, achieved as envisioned and agreed upon by the three programs. So the three levels of activity around that, Ed, I want you to be aware. Thank you, Karen. I'll appreciate that being incorporated in the record today of the meeting if possible. That was very helpful. I'll make it so. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, please. Yeah, Chair Gardo had asked me to um, be a liaison between the board and SYNC. So I've been attending SYNC meetings for the past three months. And, one of, and they're in the process of doing an update to their strategic plan. In the course of that discussion, one area that we talked about, in addition to what Karen described, was looking working with transportation agencies like on a one dig um, type of policy. So that's an area that we haven't spent much time on, but we did just did um, um, talk about it briefly, and, and the thought was to bring that up during the strategic planning process with SYNC. Thank you so much for doing that, Gary. Appreciate it, and thank you for your comment. Uh, 
that's all good work. So um, we, I realize that we have, are, are not totally behind. We have five minutes until our break, but we have a lot of issues still to, to work on before our break. Um, so I'd like to go to the lobbyist uh, proposal request. Um, but first, before I go there, I wanna make sure to uh, thank Mara uh, for all that she has done on behalf of the board. Uh, truly appreciate her uh, diligence, her, her um, professionalism, her um, just um, work that she did uh, on behalf of the board over her many years as our board lobbyist. So wanted to be sure to thank her for that, especially for our most recent successes with um, securing funds for um, our broadband and traditional programs. So truly, truly appreciate that. And if anybody has any uh, comments that they'd like to give Mara, if she's still on the call, um, would appreciate them putting them in the chat just so she has them rather than taking the time now since we're running short on time and we have an 11 o'clock uh, meeting with folks coming in that we need to, to um, keep uh, on task for. So with that, I would like to uh, have Connie talk about the uh, request for proposal, the RFQ that would go out. Thank you, Chair Gordo. Is um, what's pre being presented to you today is the lobbyist request for proposal. It's on page 46 of your board packet. And um, I have provided a um, timeline. This is prescriptive from um, the Department of Commerce RFP process. It's very, um, of all the benchmarks, the timing is this um, request for proposal will be um, submitted and posted on the Washington electronic bid system. So that's the reason the, psych, the RFP is stating it'll be opening on um, July 14th to give enough time for people to um, post this where it's needed to be. So it's ready. Is um, I am the contact for the um, RFP. And so question and answer will um, is between when it's posted until July 23rd. And then I will respond to answers no later than July 30th. The proposals are due August 6th. Um, the, I believe it's the executive committee that are reviewing um, the proposals. And, um, and so that's targeted around August 11th. And the executive committee decide if they want to um, have oral interviews or not. Um, if so, it's to be around August 18th. And then um, we have the apparent successful contractor is I need to send notifications to the unsuccessful ones on um, August 19th. And this is a period of time is that I have to make sure that the board doesn't open um, award a contract until um, September 10th. So I need that block of time for in case we have protesters um, against the um, RFP selection. Um, then we can, I will hold um, debriefing conferences on September 3rd. And then we hope then um, beginning contract work is September 13th. We've had, I've had discussion with um, Karen Burkholz and um, Archer Gardo as to if we wanted to provide a range is right now the RFP is talking about up to 100,000. And Chair Gardo, did you want to um, talk about what your thoughts on that? Or, what we, or do you want me to refresh? Yes, sorry, I was on mute there and I was just looking. So I did have some conversation with um, via email with Connie and Karen about the contract amount um, and was uh, curious um, uh, at, at how the, the, the dollar figure had been uh, chosen and um, was also told that the, um, the uh, budgets have not been done for this upcoming biennium uh, yet. So, uh, uh, and I was, um, th this was the same amount that had been in the past with Mara and perhaps even a little bit less than with Mara. Um, and whether it makes sense to um, have a, an hourly uh, request for an hourly wage, or if it made sense to have a range for uh, the, the cost uh, that we'd be willing to pay for a lobbyist, and just would like some discussion on that. 
um, and not having, um, I know in the consulting world, what we usually do is we have an hourly rate and how many hours and a not to exceed. So there's a lot of ways that this could be structured, but if anybody has some recommendations or thoughts on that, um, I'd appreciate knowing that. And I or will- they think this is reasonable. Go ahead, please, Connie. I, I was just gonna say is I forgot that you had asked me to um, speak on the previous um, RFPs. The um, last RFP that was done in um, 2019 is we had set aside 110,000 and then to, um, the prior biennium was 100,000. Um, and then I've also like um, Chair Gardo had talked about budget, we haven't, um, Built it is, it looks like, you know, we could probably have a range between 90 and up to, you know, 120. Um, but she definitely wanted to hear what the different board members um, had thoughts on this. Please, Karen. I see your hand is raised, Karen. Maybe it's from before. Uh, Gary, please. Uh, does the contract limit the uh, contractor to um, how many clients they can have uh, beyond the uh, public works board? I, it would not, we would, I, I, well, I, what I was going to say, it would not at this stage, we're just asking for RFQs. So it, we would, that'd be something we would ask, I would imagine during uh, vetting of the, of the uh, potential uh, lobbyist. And it's presented in the RFP who their other clients are. So, um, yeah. but it's not a limitation. It's just an RFP and it's something that is reviewed by the um, executive committee. Since the contractors can have more than one client, I think that the $100,000 is uh, a reasonable number. Uh, Member Stern, please. Take the opposite for perspective, the other side of the coin from the care, uh, question Gary just answered, which is with so many potential applicants coming in, uh, are we concerned about a limited pool to draw from that would have no real or uh, perceived conflict of interest uh, during these funding cycles involving ports, cities, counties, uh, special purpose districts, et cetera? Thank you, Member Stern. Any other questions, comments? Somebody want to make a motion? Okay, I I have one. I was having trouble finding my hand. <laughs> <laughs> a question or a motion, please. A question. Um, are there any changes to this RFP from the one we have used before? Just it's the very, dates. <laughs> yeah, it's very general. It's very yes. general. The executive committee has looked at it um, and talked about it, and it's very general. And it would probably be more information about a potential um, uh, lobbyist would come through um, in our interviews of them and what they put in their proposals. Okay. And, and I think I, Connie jumped in. Do you want to say what? You were saying, Connie? My apologies. I was just saying the only thing that's been updated are the dates <laughs> as the schedule was presented to you. Okay. The board that, packet. That's very helpful. Then I will move to authorize staff to solicit a RFP for up to $100,000 for a lobbyist. And the time of performance is September 2021 to June 30th, 2023. I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? Does Mary Margaret have her hand up or? Uh, I'm, trying to I'm trying to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to clap, I saw you clap. So any, um, I'm ready to call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? Motion carries. Thank you so much. 
So um, since we're at 1015 or 1016, I'm actually going to suggest that we take our break at this point, um, just because it's been a couple hours since we started. And when we come back, we have to really be expeditious um, on the next topics because we have 11, 11 o'clock uh, must stop. Um, so I'm going to say nine minutes. We'll come back at what it was to be uh, uh, nine minute break. We will come back at 1025. So I will see you all at 1025.
Got one more minute here. Are we supposed to harass you, Catherine, uh, now that we're back? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to make sure we have a quorum, Diane. <laughs> so, yeah, you can harass me. Hey there, Mark. I have to admit, Mark, that uh, description of your pottery lift station sounded pretty gruesome. Uh, I can, I've got a video. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like, ugh. I wouldn't say it's gruesome, I'd say it's just very scary. <laughs> well, those could be different words, but for the same thing, it just sounded like, whoa. Yeah, yeah anyway, thank you, thank you all. I'm glad that the fund is available to, for you to be able to, to utilize, um, to make sure you, the city of Port, Port Archer's in good, or, good working order. Yeah, thank you. Do we have a quorum back, um, Karen? We're ready to go, Chair Gardo. Okay, perfect, perfect. So um, we are now at uh, the, uh, we've got to be real efficient here. So committee updates, and um, then we'll move to the executive director update, Mark Barkley's update, and then a uh, uh, some work on budgeting. Understanding budgeting is for 11 o'clock um, maybe we'll get a short, short break before 11 o'clock, but we may not, depending on how, hopefully people will be able to survive that. Um, but we'll try, try to do our best here. So um, I will start with our committee update, um, which in also includes our work with um, Anita Page and Roll Clarity, and also about the retreat, all important things. Um, so we had, um, I guess two meetings um, for the executive committee uh, in um, <clears throat> the um, in uh, June, um, and a lot of work around um, the upcoming work on role clarity, work around the lobbyist contract, um, uh, and I think what most and what I want to bring up at this time also is not just our executive committee work, but the work that I have done with Mara in her last month of work, which was uh, I did a couple uh, site visits um, with her, and I want to thank her for that. We uh, and she's also given us a list of uh, representatives and senators that are interested in. Um, uh, having us visit with them in, in their districts. So on uh, June 16th, um, Mara and I um, met with uh, Alex Ybarra in Quincy and did a tour of Quincy. Some really interesting work that they're doing and thinking about with water um, and how to have take water for cleaning potatoes and then also cooling service servers. Uh, oh, that's where a lot of the Microsoft Google servers are in Quincy. Um, and how do we use our water resources the best? Um, so just some very interesting conversations with them out there. Then Mara, JC, and I had uh, uh, met with um, Representative Gainer and uh, Gainer, excuse me, Gainer and Representative Steele, who are um, from the district out in uh, the Wenatchee area and had um, conversations with them. Um, really insightful conversation. So I wanted to appreciate uh, Mara for helping to set those up. And then this coming Monday, I will be going up to Skagit County to meet uh, with Representative uh, Dave Paul. Um, and uh, so looking forward to that. And I've started to reach out to some of the other folks that have uh, expressed interest in meeting with them, including uh, uh, Representative Bonke, Bonke uh, Representative Rood, uh, uh, Representative Rule, uh, and then also uh, Representative um, Wicks um, and Senator Wilson. So reaching out to all of them, I've exchanged a whole bunch of email with Skylar Rood's uh, staff person trying to find a date to make that work, trying to work that into when Jerome will also be able to be there just because I think it'd be helpful since um, he is in uh, one of the council people for the district that uh, Mr. Rood and Mr. Bonke are in. So that is some of the work that we've been doing. So I'd love to jump in now um, with Anita. I think she's here. And then we need to talk a little bit about the retreat. Uh, 
is it Karen? Are you going to take over or is it going to be uh, Anita? While Anita's coming online, I can say that the uh, board members, uh, for your knowledge, uh, we are organizing a, an icebreaker event for you, location to be determined on the 29th of September in Wenatchee. The retreat will take place at the Con Confluence Technology Center in Wenatchee all day, the 30th of September and half day, uh, the 1st of October with a board meeting in the afternoon of October 1st. Ellen and I will finish up all the logistical details and send them out to the board um, very soon. Our goal is to have all those details locked down by next Thursday. And so we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail at next week's executive committee as well. And I see Anita's on the line, so I'll turn it over to Anita. Um, Karen, just before we get Anita on, I think it's also important that I, I think we're going to be inviting current board members who could be um, no longer on the board at that time. Is that correct? To the retreat, I have not gotten that far in my thinking. I don't, I think that this is really, we, we should talk about that executive. Next okay, because I had thought Anita had suggested it. So please, Anita, go ahead. Thank you so much, Chair Gardell. I appreciate you having me here. Um, with respect to time, uh, Karen and I will actually be talking about the best way to carry the work forward into the retreat now that we know we're going to be able to meet in person with consideration of everyone's schedules and, and what participation may look like for you all. It would be fabulous if we could get everyone's perspective, the current, the exiting, and the entering board members as we go into the retreat piece of it. Um, from my perspective, being able to accomplish that work most successfully will be me submitting to you a form that I would love to share with each of the board members so we can get their feedback and perspective on how they perceive roles to be at the strategic, tactical, and, and task level, meaning the governance and operations piece of it. Um, I will submit that for your request. And once that happens, I will email out that form to each and every one that are, are present here today and those that are joining you in this near future. And then follow that up with a one-on-one -on -one just to get a full understanding. I'll then gather all of that work and bring it forward into the retreat piece of it where we will finalize our expectations around role responsibility and function, the board level and what that perception is, the commerce level, what that perception is, the ED chair role um, and staff and what that looks like. So our goal is when we walk out of that session, which will be our retreat, is we will have identified um, post work that we can use to support the role clarity, things like your charters and having consistency and how they're laid out and what they say and how they function. Everything that you identify as a work product will be delivered post retreat. Think of it as an intensive deep dive that is a carryover from the work we started on December 4th. And some of us were not there on December 4th, like Ed Stern and I. So, <laughs> so, but, but, so what I had heard, and I guess Karen and I hadn't talked about this yet, is that I had heard that you would like uh, current board members who will be coming off the board to come if they are available. Is that correct, Anita? Is that what I heard? We had that conversation when we went through the scope of work and talked about being able to get that perspective. Um, if those board members are available and if they can or can't come, and again, I've been working really closely with Karen so that we can set up the best retreat possible for you. Um, whether we have them there at the board meeting to finalize or we capture their voice, uh, we will leave you know, to the agency and what's best for you all as a board. And we can go into a deeper dive around that conversation and what some of those logistics might look like. I'm not sure on the room size, how many people could be in there, if we're having any capacity issues or, or any of those things. So originally we were still on the fence as to whether or not we'd be in person or virtual. Now that it's in person, I think it would be a really good idea for us to revisit that and, and what it might look like with consideration to everyone's health and well-being and most importantly to their comfort zones. Great, thank you. And are there any questions from Karen on the retreat or any questions of Anita um, on the work that we are um, venturing forth on? No, I just, I wanted to share with, sorry, this is Diane. Um, 
I still remember the first retreat that Anita came to speak to us at, and we were at a hotel in, there in uh, Olympia. And um, I think we came into that meeting, Anita, looking to resign um, and having the whole board resign because we were so frustrated with how we, we went. And you were able to capture all of our different attitudes and things like that. So I can see, even though we're going to have a big change in, in people and stuff like that, I think that your ability that you were able to pull all of us together is something that I think that the board members now can know that going forward, that you're, you're just amazing. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Diane. Thank you. Any other uh, questions of, of Anita or Karen with respect to the retreat? Uh, this or is JC, Chair Anita's Gregor. work? Please. <clears throat> Thing. Um, and and um, if you're at the Confluence Technology Center that you're talking about meeting in, that that building um, lends itself very well to hybrid meetings. It has some of the best technology. It has the best technology in Central Washington. So just for you to keep in mind in your planning, they're very large screens and very spacious rooms, and it is open at full capacity right now. So just just a FYI's. Thank you for that, JC. Thank you so much. Kind of exciting, gosh, to meet people. The, the thing that I've noticed most in meeting people that I've only met online is when I meet them and I find out how tall they are. It's just it's kind of a mind blow. It's like, oh, I didn't know you were so tall or I didn't know you were so short. <laughs> so, uh, or shorter than I am, not that I'm that, that, that tall, but we all look the same height when we're online, so. Um, any other questions on the executive committee or what we've been doing? So um, Jason, if not, could you please give us an update on the communications committee? Absolutely, thank you, Chair Gardo. Um, since the last board meeting, uh, the communications committee has met a couple times. Uh, the first session was really a debrief from um, the board meeting and kind of condensing down and crystallizing the um, bits of wisdom that we got from uh, the discussion with our legislative champions, um, really kind of focusing in on, on what we heard and what we didn't hear, um, you know, and, and validating the, the level of support that the Public Works Board does have and kind of uh, the best steps moving forward. Um, you know, the key messages, of course, being um, surrounding uh, securing the revenue streams, preventing um, cash sweeps, and then also um, a sentiment that was echoed a couple of times, which was um, asking big because um, now's the time to try to get um, some of what was taken back. So that was that was the first meeting. The second meeting, um, we talked a lot about the upcoming legislative priorities. We went through uh, the delivery methods that we have utilized in the past. Um, the committee agreed that really developing a ledge uh, strategy kind of needs to wait until we get a new lobbyist on board. In the interim, of course, we will update um, what we have traditionally used. And I did use the opportunity to discuss with the committee members um, that have, have been involved with uh, advocating on the Hill for the Public Works Board in the past, you know, what is the uh, effect you know of the materials that are presented are there any holes is there anything that um would be needed and so you know i think moving forward the biggest thing for the committee is to be able to have everything prepped that we can before session because once session starts um you know we'll need to be tied to responding to direct questions so that's communications Thank you, Jason. Excellent. Uh, does anybody on the committee have anything they want to add or have any questions? Uh, does the, any of the board members have any questions of Jason? Uh, yes, please, Pam. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say I was very impressed by the um, memo about the training sessions. 
and the topics that were covered and the different pres presenters. It sounds very interesting and like it must have been very valuable for those um, people attending. So kudos to the committee for putting that together. Well, that's actually the Technical Assistance Committee, which we'll get to next. Okay, but yes, okay. totally agree with you. Jason <laughs> Jason jumps around a lot. So yes, yes. <laughs> well, you, you had a great segue there. I'll just make the comment on the Communications Committee. We have a great team. We are going to miss um, Diane from our committee. Uh, Diane and I were on the committee back in the day uh, when we actually created it back, you know, 10 years ago or so now. And she's always got pointed comments uh, uh, made on this topic. Um, and then I know I'm looking forward to continuing to work with Jerome and Ed. Jerome has done a great job um, uh, chairing this, Jerome Delvin, uh, Commissioner Delvin. Um, so I see Diane's face. So Diane may want to say something. No, I just I just want to thank the committee. Uh, they've been very open-minded and, um, and willing to try a lot of new things. And I think that's the thing that we just need to remember that um, we have new legislators every two years. We have new board members. We have to continually educate and maybe change the way we communicate because we all learn things differently. So hats off to the committee for looking at new things. Thank you to Diane. Any I have comments? to take my hat off, Diane. I'd rather keep it on for the rest of the meeting because of my work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other comments on communications? Uh, so let's jump to technical assistance. And we already heard from uh, uh, Pam and congratulating them. And I totally agree that uh, the technical assistance committee has done amazing work, spe uh, specifically with uh, Diane and Bubba being the leaders of this. Um, just looking at the numbers of who attended and how many attended. I do know that um, Going forward, uh, hopefully there are members who are coming on board who are interested in technical assistance. We're losing so many members involved with a technical assistance off the board. So it'd be something we'll have to look at as we go forward. But is there any um, anything you'd like to say, uh, Diane, uh, Bubba, or um, Mr. Freeze? So I'd like to jump in real quick because I think that um, uh, Jason has done a wonderful job on this committee and. Um, to thank him and Mark for um, allowing me to be so pushy once I got on this committee and um, trying to really push doing education and helping everybody um, get out there. I'm so pleased with the way Jason came up with the report. Um, it's something like this that, that we need for our committee, and he's planning on uh, already getting next year's already started working on that. So it's really exciting to see how it's, it's going, and I, I think it's in good hands. Mark, do you want to say anything? No, just uh, just great work. Appreciate all the hard work Jason's done and Diane. I think uh, if you haven't taken the time to read the information in your board packet, it's it's great stuff. Please do. Thank you. Any other comments on any of the work the committees have been doing? Okay, let's jump into your update, uh, Karen, please. Thank you, Turk Rado. I'm looking at the time real quick because I want to make sure we have enough. Um, I will be very speedy. Uh, first off, we have some important dates uh, coming ahead for the board. And these are related to the board actions on August 6th regarding authorizing staff to develop and uh, submit decision packages. Um, the, important dates that I want you to be sure to know is that the first draft of decision packages are due August 16th, the second draft August 23rd. Director Brown reviews those and develops the final list on August 30th. Uh, we will have the opportunity as a board to affirm uh, the work that the staff is doing around our decision package and policy requests at our meeting on September 10th. Uh, but please note that the turnaround time to get things into OFM is very, very tight. Uh, the deadline is October, I mean, September 13th. Uh, my memo to you outlines the full schedule there and you're looking at it now on your screen. 
in terms of the priorities that have been discussed so far with each committee, I believe, and also executive committee several times, and that'll be happening on a weekly basis with executive. Um, I just spoke with Catherine yesterday. And so your latest uh, request, Catherine, I haven't added in yet, but note that I will be. Um, the ones in green, uh, consider those budget related. The ones in blue are policy. Uh, the first one, your first row is basically a supplementary budget request for more money for our traditional and broadband programs. You've heard from Connie, uh, the robust, robust demand and interest in our traditional program. Uh, we had an existing pipeline with broadband. We're affirming both of those uh, pipelines as we speak so that we have the best information justifying our, our budget requests going forward. Um, the second one there is uh, the making sure that the success that we had last session with the 129 million from the Public Works Assistance Account for our traditional program and our uh, 60 million for broadband, uh, that we keep holding the course and the sunset dates for the uh, diversions from our revenue streams hold and that those revenue sources come back into our account um, so that we have them available for uh, funding local priority projects. Um, that's the second row. The third row is the concept that uh, because of fire season, because of other unforeseen circumstances that our emergency, that our broadband program should have an emergency component to it, just like traditional. And it would follow the same uh, authorities that we have for emergency program now and our WAC um, and just extend and emulate that on the, the broadband side. Uh, the, the concept that Chair Gardo is very interested in uh, is that nexus between innovative infrastructure and resiliency around climate change and equity and water. Um, water is going to be um, a, an increasingly important topic as we're experiencing massive heat, uh, snowpack that is not as it used to be um, and causing all sorts of effects and cumulative effects from that. And can we have, uh, say, a pilot program of, of 30 to 50 million that we would put out there to as demonstration projects almost of what innovative infrastructure could be? Um, and so that's one idea there that I still have to add to this list. Um, we will be updating this and sending this list out to all of the board members with the August board packet. This is what we were going to spend considerable time talking about on August 6th so that you can authorize our team to develop these packages for you. Um, the ones in blue, uh, Sheila mentioned earlier this morning about the fact that our RCW, and this is for both traditional and PWB uh, broadband, is not included in some of the, the, the statutes that protect interests of private sector um, applicants or tribal applicants to programs like CURB or other ones within the Department of Commerce. We want to have that same sort of standing for PWB going forward. Um, and so that's what that first row in blue is for you, is that um, item that is it mentioned in our after action review from the broadband program in some memos that the board has had with actions related to broadband over the past several months. Um, it's a way of positioning our program most effectively for the future. The ones that are following the broadband statutory modifications, these are ones that uh, we've actually been talking about as a board since 2020. Um, some of them we originally thought there was going to be a special session in the summer of 2020. Uh, that didn't come to pass. We thought that the governor could carry these forward and champion them. The governor's office felt that was overstepping their authorities, so they wanted a legislative champion. We lacked a legislative vehicle. And I'm hoping that this year we can come up with what that, that vehicle is to affect some of these changes so that our program is uh, as effective as it can be, and also that we have parity with our sister programs. For example, what the UTC review, which we were successful to get stricken out from our statute for this biennium, make that a standing item 
uh, the objection process. Ours is the only program, as Member Rowe has said, that has that requirement in it. Um, why is that? And does it add value? Is it because we have the private sector applicants? Um, what can we do to make that objection process work for um, all parties involved um, the way that the legislature intended? So those are the ones there. Um, if you could go to page two, Jason, thank you. Um, so items one through six that are in blue there for broadband, these are things that the board has discussed before. They've gone through uh, Sandra's review as well. Um, we wanna keep them alive. We wanna keep the conversation going around these. Do these become agency requests uh, combined with some other uh, statutory tweaks or fixes that the broadband office may, may be seeking too? So we've got some scale there behind these requests, or is this something that the, the board with our lobbyist team brings directly to legislators next session? We could pursue it as a dual track. Um, there are those options there for you. Um, the concepts at the bottom, I only did, I didn't put them in rows yet because they hadn't been vetted and discussed at executive committee. Once we talk about them at executive committee next week, you'll see them incorporated. Um, the first one there, is an idea floated from one of our guests last month about maybe it's time for us to ask for repayment on that IOU from the Public Works Assistance account to recapitalize that account so that we can do more to serve the communities of the state. Um, the notion of the 14 million for the broadband program, the state dollars that were appropriated by the legislature this past session, the notion of fixing, that's not something we do as a board, we could go to the legislature and the idea is, you know, could we get those dollars converted to grant um, or would we transfer the 14 million over to uh, the, the traditional program to get further down the qualifying the, the projects that met threshold when we're probably going to run out of money um, and we probably will need more um, or or. Um, and so that's the thing about moving it over to traditional. That's a conversation to be had. Yet another conversation to be had is, is there value in combining our two accounts, the Public Works Assistance account and the statewide broadband account? Both are in the purview of the board. Would combining them give the board greater flexibility to do more and apply its good judgment to the grant loan mix between uh, projects for award? Um, just a thought, and it's something for the board to consider. The, Last one on the list is the notion that we now have public ports, we have tribes that are eligible for public works support. Um, and should we expand the table to invite those stakeholder groups to the table too? Um, so that, those are some of the concepts that we'll start talking about um, on Thursday of next week, which is Ellen's last day with us. Um, that's at the forefront of my mind. Uh, and so that's sort of what we're gonna be working on moving ahead, Chair Gardo. Um, we've updated the calendar of actions for you. You'll see that updated in your packet. It's right behind my memo. Um, everything that I've run through really fast is in my memo, but for these new concepts that I highlighted for you just a few moments ago. And with that, I'll conclude, uh, Catherine. I'd love to have questions and comments, but we don't have time. <laughs> so we're gonna be talking about these uh, in August. And the reason we don't have time is because uh, we have guests arriving. Uh, one thing I will ask with our guests, I want to make sure that we have a few minutes at the end for a board to come back. So I'm going to ask that our, our uh, 11 o'clock only go to 10 of 12. So we'll have 10 extra minutes at the end if we want to have any discussion on any of these items. So Mark, um, we, we have a uh, we have just six minutes to go before our guests arrive. So if you please. Thanks. Next slide, please. Keep going, Jason. Yep. Okay, in here, uh, I'll be brief. I will not go through all this. I just wanna orient you to the chart. So this is just an excerpt of the local government capital budget. Uh, there on the left, the activity that you'll see there then you'll see columns, the, col the first column is kind of because hidden from the drop down arrows is FTEs if they were assigned, the state dollars, the federal dollars, other dollars, which includes like the public works account, then a total. 
So I'll just kind of get to the bottom, uh, bottom line up front. You'll see down in the bottom right corner, total new dollars to local government division is $1.5 billion. Reapproach's at $850 million. And so a total combined capital budget for local government division, we're uh, just shy of $2.5 billion. The one activity I did want to highlight for you, and I'll try to um, get it here. So I've got to find it on, again, apologize. Um, so almost near the bottom, about five or six from the bottom is a, a line item, LGD uh, growth management or GMS. There's grants for affordable housing development connections. You'll see those two numbers there, it's a mix of state and federal dollars. Just wanna highlight that, make you aware of that. There is an effort there that has been ongoing is to help communities, local governments, uh, with side, side sewer connection, water connection, some of those fees that developers have to do on it. So they kind of shy away at creating more not just affordable housing, but even, you know, um, housing at all different levels. So that will help entice a community and a developer to do some development and be able to absorb some of those costs of those connection fees, not impact fees. So we're not going there, but some connection fees for developers uh, that the local government would be a part in playing and helping attract developers to create more mid-level housing uh, within their communities and or affordable housing. So it's just a new, brand new program. We'll see how it works, but wanted you to make uh, yourself aware of that. And kind of based on time, if there's other questions there, if you want to send me an email, if you have any questions on any of the other uh, capital uh, programs here, uh, there's a lot of great uh information on the commerce webpage that you can I can steer you to as well as happy to address any questions you might have offline from that. So next slide. Really wanted to touch quick on the American Rescue Plan and the dollars here. I think we're all kind of aware of the dollars. Um, but uh, what the big effort we're doing is uh, I think Ed, you talked to it a little bit about how can we coordinate so I just want to, at the commerce level, we're really focused on coordinating state dollars, state federal dollars with the city dollars and county dollars. So I just really, I mean, we're really, and we'll absolutely will come to you with more information as we kind of roll that out. So Scott Merriman at OFM, myself, Tony Hansen, Karen will be involved. We're really going to try to figure out how we can get our arms wrapped around the state dollars and what we're doing, but linking that to what the cities and counties are doing. So we're, you know, with uh, Peter King, we're working with him very closely and his team, uh, with counties, with Eric Johnson and his team. And I'm even going out to COGS, to county, whoever will ask me, I will go out and talk about the dollars right now. But then as we kind of move down this road, activities that we're starting to engage in. And so, yes, the sink is absolutely a great forum, but there's external forums that we want to, and maybe even within sync, we can invite the AWC and WASAC folks into some of those discussions as well. But it's really in the effort to combine how even tribes, how can we include their projects so we're getting the most out of our money here. So that's the effort. Next slide. And again, these are the eligible uses. We talked about that. And the last one there is the water sewer broadband. So we're very keen to those uh, uses. And with the capital funds, we understand mostly those that funding source is really towards broadband and some other narrow areas, but very similar to the um, kind of the rules that will govern it, we believe. So next slide, please. And this is most important. I was gonna ask to have these clicked on, but please click on these. These are the US Treasury sites for all the information on, on the state and local, as well as when the other funds and their guidance gets posted, we'll see those as well. And I will get those out to you as well, or, or Karen can. But, and then the last kind of lower link there is sam.gov. And those are specific 
to the federal regulations and requirements that govern these funds. So we talked about that a little bit. And one last point, uh, and Ed, I really wanted to kind of zero back into that. The one dig, and, and Gary brought this up, I am seeing that language in the house side of the infrastructure bill moving its way through federal uh, as we kind of see that kind of move and hopefully we see something by August. But there is some one dig language in that federal guidance and that legislation that's coming to us. So if that passes, there's going to even be some federal requirements that we're going to have to manage with broadband and uh, basically federal highways. So a very, very important place to go look and keep track on all these things. And again, as we kind of have additional board meetings, as more and more of this information comes out, I'll make sure that you all are aware of it. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mark. And sorry for being so rushed here. Um, if those uh, links, besides being put in the chat, if they could come out in an email later, that would be appreciated. Um, it's funny, my, my engineering career started 40 years ago and uh, it's just amazing that one dig isn't just the way things are done yet. <laughs> it just, it's, it was talked about 40 years ago. So it's about time. So with that, uh, we're at 11 o'clock and um, I, um, 11.01 actually. So I'd like to, uh, to uh, delay um, uh, Cindy's presentation. Um, and that, uh, and I it doesn't say this in our agenda that we are going to go till it says we're going to noon, but I'd like to have the next uh, session end at uh, 1150 so we can come back to either coming back to Cindy or perhaps some um, discussion on, we'll just decide what we want to talk about then. So with that, um, Jason, if you could bring up the slide for the um, uh, round table discussion. So I believe we have four participants today. Um, and the four that I know of, welcome. Thank you for coming. We Last month we had a discussion from our stakeholders around traditional infrastructure. And today it's um, a discussion conversation with our um, uh, participants in our broadband program. So we have uh, Nick Courtney from the Macaw Nation and um, he is the broad brand program specialist. We have James Thompson, the executive director of the Washington Public Ports Association. We have Don Eichner, the deputy director of the state broadband office. Excited to see Don in that role. I was served with Don when I was on the public works board in the past. So appreciate her continued in interest and um, advocacy around infrastructure. And we had Stafford Strong of Charter Communications. Um, I could go into more detail on all of these, but I'm not going to do that. So if, as you, um, if, as you say hello, uh, perhaps um, you can at least give a tiny, tiny bio. Um, and as you can see, we have, these are the same questions that we asked um, in the past on traditional. So thoughts on the 2020, 2021, um, actually it's the 2020, or thoughts on the successes of the 2021 legislative session. Any things uh, that you would consider priorities for the next session? Um, and perhaps we just leave it there and then we'll go to C and D. Um, so why don't we start with Nick, if he is here? Hi, He's good morning here. and good afternoon. Can you hear me? There he is, okay. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Chair Gardo, uh, Vice Chair Baldwin and, and members of the Washington State Public Works uh, Board. Uh, Kukupasa Oxwell. My name is Nicholas Courtney. Uh, I'm a member of the Macaw tribe uh, and grew up in a little bit south of Seattle and uh, Auburn, Washington. I currently reside in Washington, D.C., uh, where I work for the Department of Commerce and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration uh, as a uh, broadband program specialist. Uh, I'm actually in my third week uh, at the Department of Commerce and previous to that so, uh, served as the director of policy at the National Congress of American Indians uh, located in Washington, DC. Uh, thank you so much for that last presentation. Uh, that was a, a great highlight. Um, I think some of the successes of the 2021 legislative session, um, we've seen the, of course, you all know the two, uh, the two broadband bills uh, that were passed. Um, and with the House Bill 1336 um, kind of prevailing in that sense. 
Um, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm coming from more of a federal, um, federal background. Um, and we have seen the Consolidated Appropriations Act uh, of 2021, which uh, provided uh, you know billions and millions of dollars uh, towards broadband. We know that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic exacerbated uh, the need for uh, telecommunications broadband services to all of our all of our citizens and all of our uh, Washington uh, folks in Washington State. Uh, when we're talking about telehealth, we're talking about remote education. We're also talking about workforce development and uh, you know all of that good things. So I think one of the things that we're continuing to emerge uh, and that will be a trend, um, not only in the state of Washington and at the federal level, but in all states is this blending of both federal and state fundings and how these federal fundings, we've seen major investments from the federal level. Uh, we have uh, in the upcoming infrastructure package, the bipartisan framework, identified nearly $65 billion for broadband um, coming from the federal level. Um, and that's for states, tribes, and local municipalities. So I think that what we'll see uh, at the state level is how are we um, being an all-encompassing approach to broadband when we're thinking of uh, digging water and sanitation lines? How are we being intentional about communicating with those entities and working together to ensure that broadband are also in those trenches and things like that? So. I think that everyone, um, you know, here in Capitol, uh, here in Washington D.C. and on the Hill, from my conversations, are are thinking of of those types of things of how can we uh, really be intentional in, in working together um, across sectors. And I think that you all have, uh, you know, in this type of forum is a great opportunity to have those dialogues. So I'm excited to to dig in uh, further and to hear from our other participants. But again, thank you so much for having us. Uh, and uh, yeah, look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Nick. That was perfect. So James, then Don and uh, Stafford, and I would say about three minutes a piece would be great. So uh, we have then time to come back to the other comments and then we also have time for board questions. So uh, James, please. Is James on? Is uh, Don? Why don't we go to Don and then come back to James? Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everybody. Don Eichner, Deputy Director of the State Broadband Office. And um, as Catherine mentioned, I have a history with Public Works Board. Um, many years ago, I did program and policy development for both Public Works and for CURB, and then left the Department of Commerce to go up to the legislature. And I was with the House of Representatives as a nonpartisan policy analyst, mostly working on human services issues uh, for the past six years. So I am a recent returner to commerce. I've been with the broadband office for about a month. So like Nick, relatively new in my position. Um, regarding the 2021 session, I think as, as Nick said, there's really this unprecedented energy and interest around broadband due to the pandemic and it's really bipartisan. Um, and a huge focus on closing the digital divide. So there's been a focus on equity, affordability, and training. We saw that um, for the broadband office in the appropriations we received, both in the capital budget for infrastructure funding and in the operating budget for equity work. So we will be um, focusing on launching a digital equity um, forum in partnership with the State Office of Equity um, there's also some grant funding that will be coming out from our office for equity um, and affordability. So look for that in the near future. Um, as far as trends go, I, I think a, a major theme for us is also partnering on the federal level um, to make sure that Washington is, that our communities are really well positioned to take advantage of the funding that's coming our way. Um, this could really be a once in a lifetime opportunity for us. And so for, for the broadband office, um, many of you may be familiar with the concept of BATS, broadband action teams. These are community-based teams um, having conversations around local needs for broadband. And our office is supporting that work, really trying to empower communities to have informed direct conversations with providers um, to identify areas of need and where to focus that funding. 
And um, in addition to our state dollars that we'll be putting out, we are also providing support to communities to seek federal funding um, through grant writing services that we will have available soon that will be free to communities who want to pursue federal grants and um, also matching funds that were in the capital budget appropriation that we can help help with for federal grant opportunities. So that's what we're, we're looking towards in terms of federal partnerships. Wow, interesting. Um, what's most interesting is also just uh, helping with grant applications as we're opening our cycle. So that's very interesting to hear. So um, Stafford, would you go uh, next please? And is um, James available? I only saw somebody as a phone number. I didn't see James' name on the list, but Stafford, if you would uh, go next please. Thank you for having me and, and inviting us uh, to this meeting. I'm Stafford Strong. I represent Charter Communications. We uh, are a broadband provider, uh, mostly east of the Cascades. We have about 215,000 uh, broadband subscribers here in the state. And because we are in a lot of those rural areas of the state, we are uh, active on the broadband grants. Um, and I do want to give a, a shout out to the Public Works Board and a thank you to last year's broadband grant cycle. It was the first year. And, and as you know, the broadband grant cycle passed before the pandemic came. And so you can imagine uh, the task at hand of the Public Works Board when uh, last year happened and then we went into the uh, uh, into the pandemic. So I, I think the Public Works Board did a wonderful job. Um, and that was a good reason of why the, the legislature had such an easy time funding more money into the, the program for this next upcoming year. So thank you to the Public Works Board on that successful program. Um, and touching briefly on some of these points, some successes from the 2021 legislative session. Anytime you deal with funding and getting money to broadband or to anywhere, it's, it's a success. And uh, there was a lot of funding that was was put towards broadband into various pools and, and different parts of money that's going to be able to, to be put out. I, th I think upwards of almost $400 million from the state alone, let alone the federal grants. So that that was a success. And, and not only that, but the programs that they were put into, um, I think, are good and, and were strong. Um, as a private provider, we, we appreciated the overbuild protections specifically that were put into those. Um, and how they were structured in such a way that it really does and, and will hopefully promote getting broadband to those truly last mile uh, rural areas. Um, and so that is a success. As we look forward and move forward, I think there are some things we can fine tune and that we can work towards. Some of those things would be to utilize strategies to encourage as many participants as possible. There's a lot of providers in the state and a lot that uh, are in rural areas and if we can provide ways that we can get as many providers to apply and to expand their networks through these grant dollars and utilize those that would be um, some goals that we could have and and just going off Don's comments of helping uh, with grant writing and other strategies in the state broadband office um, and noting the good work they're doing. Um, so thank you for having me and I, I look forward to this conversation and uh, I'll hand it back to you Catherine. Thank you. But um, <laughs> it's that old mute button. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, uh, good to hear. And is James in the room now um, from the Catherine, ports? This is JC. I just reached out to him in a private text and he said he's waiting to be let into the meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, not having the control of that is um, Ellen. Uh, not in the waiting room that I can see him, unfortunately, but I'm checking in with him too. Um, so we'll, we'll get this sorted out. Okay, okay. I saw a phone number there, but I didn't see uh, um, his name. So let's move on to um, the three priorities for the, the uh, Public Works Board and come, then we can come back to James. And then the, the, I, the, the, one of them is financial stability. Um, for the board. So kind of C and D kind of go together. So, um, you know, obviously investing in broadband is critically important. It's financial stability, sustainability for the board's work is extremely important. And with that is uh, where we would um, permanent funding for broadband and where, what ideas do you all have on that? And then um, thinking about um, climate change, um, equity, 
and that that the infra the how those connect to broadband um, services um, would be uh, extremely helpful. I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear from you on that. And why don't we go back to Nick, please, in another three to five minutes. All right. Thank you, Chair. And uh, it's a great question. I think, um, again, when we're talking about infrastructure, uh, you know, sustainability and, and really what does that mean? Um, I think on our side, we're looking at sustainability uh, as a whole in a holistic manner. You mentioned um, climate change. We know um, being a, a coastal uh, a coastal state that Washington faces uh, climate change differently than those in, in um, that aren't on one of the uh, one of our two coasts. So I think um, talking about and and seeing what um, innovative strategies there are um, and recognizing the realities that we're in with rising sea levels. Um, we've seen our hottest summer of, of the year. Uh, this year, uh, we being Washington, as, as I'm there, as I've heard from my family, at least, um, and seen on the news. So I think that'll continue to, um, to, to grow, uh, unfortunately. I also think when we talk about sustainability, uh, I would encourage folks to think about workforce development. Um, who are maintaining these broadband systems? How are, um, how are entities ensuring that there is a workforce in place? Um, in five and 10 years so that these uh, broadband systems don't become obsolete. Um, again, that's one thing that we're looking at in our program. How are they um, partnering or communicating effectively with local institutions of higher education? Um, that can be trade schools. Um, Washington State has uh, so many great public colleges and community college systems. Um, so I, I would I would highly recommend that those types of entities are communicating as well. Um, and we also talked, you know, and someone mentioned how are we in our in our, the previous presenter mentioned working with tribes. Um, Washington State is home to 29 federally recognized tribes, as many of you um, know. And I think ensuring that that work and that that those entities are also um, communicating for sustainability. Um, I, yes, I'm, I'm a tribal member, so I'm slightly biased, but, you know, our, our tribal communities, I think, are really looking at um, sustainability in, in, a, in a good way, um, especially when we're talking about environmental sustainability and things like that. So I think um, those, are, those are some things that I talk about uh, or think about. I'm not sure when we're talking about funding. Um, I do see a large one-time investments from the federal side again, from the, uh, the last COVID package um, and those treasury funds. Treasury also has the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund. Uh, but again, these are one-time payments. Um, and I imagine that this next infrastructure package will, will be similar. Uh, hopefully that the funding window for those projects um, and those upcoming appropriations will be longer than just one year, because I do think that it is, it's incredibly important to do adequate planning and to you know not be forced or rushed into these projects, um, and I know also that states and, and local municipalities are receiving more money probably in the last year than they have in the you know ever uh, in one-time payments in that sense. So I think really being strategic about those items and and not feeling rushed and letting your representatives know both at the state and at the federal level um, of the work that you are doing, but you know, um, of the amount of conversations that are needed. And uh, when we're talking about supply chain management, when we're talking about, you know, the materials needed, the man and or woman and them power needed to engage in these types of projects um, is not always there. And, and do we as a country have the capacity um, to do all of this at once in a one year time, if that's the time period. So I would encourage you all to um, communicate with your representatives, again, both at the federal and state level. Um, I think, you know, Washington, uh, although we have folks on all sides of the spectrum of um, government ideology, I think that that's a something that they all understand that anyone can understand when we're looking at huge infrastructure projects and when the administration is, um, you know, discussing and framing these types of investments in a once in a lifetime investment for our country. Well, a once in a lifetime investment really needs that planning um, for that sustainability to ensure that these projects are here for five, for 10, for 20 years down the road. 
Excellent comments, uh, Nicholas, appreciate it. Um, so I understand that James has arrived um, from the ports and uh, we've kind of jumped through uh, the first two questions and are now on to um, the, the, uh, the last two questions, but James, we would love to uh, learn from you uh, what your thoughts were on the successes of the 2021 legislative session, uh, emerging trends and hints for the future and uh, on what the 2022 session uh, looks like uh, that we as the Public Works Board could go on. And then I will come back to you for the other two comments so you get to hear uh, the other participants talk about those. So I'd love to meet you and uh, <laughs> learn your thoughts. Very good. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry, I, I was off in some Zoom waiting room. I don't know uh, what wait, waiting room that was in, but obviously not the right one. But I was watching uh, much of your meeting on TVW. It's great that we have that resource. Uh, uh, it was really quite an interesting and productive session for ports. And as you all know, we're all about infrastructure. For us, um, uh, economic development is about, uh, which is our mission, is really about capital planning around uh, infrastructure, largely. There's policy work in there too, but uh, certainly uh, largely about infrastructure. And it was a very successful session for many reasons. There was a uh, very important uh, push on uh, uh, stabilizing and invigorating the economy and uh, a lot of federal money to do that with, uh, which takes pressure. We, we um, the ports feel the same kind of pressure that the Public Works Board does in leaner times when accounts that we care about very much are used for uh, purposes other than what we believe them to be intended to be. So the public uh, works account, for example, uh, has been diverted many times over, I think six years in a row during my tenure in Olympia. Um, and uh, we have a fund very similar to that that we refer to as MOTCA, the Model Toxics Cleanup Account. And uh, we fight vigorously to make sure that that's well-funded. It was created by initiative of the citizens of the state of Washington for cleanup purposes. And that's really about infrastructure because we repurpose brownfields for the development of infrastructure. And uh, we had a good session around that. It's well-funded and it feels stable at the moment. Um, in terms of other important things that happened for us, obviously uh, <clears throat> the funding of broadband, very important for a large number of ports. And uh, there was, you know, there's great news around that and we're very excited about it. Um, and I, I don't need to describe that to any of you, but you know, Curb, uh, Russ's office um, and PWB, and uh, we're happy uh, participants in your process there at PWB. Um, the transportation funding, also an infrastructure interest for us, um, had a sad ending. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, we can re reinvigorate that. Um, very interesting uh, moment at, in the in the 21 days following session, which were, were um, uh, where many uh, uh, government affairs organizations and lobbyists like to take a deep breath after Sine died. We did not have that opportunity because of the uh, the necessity to engage vigorously in the governor's office and with others to make sure that uh, um, things weren't vetoed, things were signed. Etc. And it was a challenging moment. And um, we, uh, through during that period, uh, um, this is I'm not celebrating a success here, but the, we're, this is a little bit about future work, I guess. So um, the uh, ports were supportive of uh, carbon pricing mechanisms, uh, which was a which was a, a kind of a shift for the Ports Association. We did a lot of work in the interim to discuss opportunities for ports around carbon funding. Many ports find opportunity there and particularly as it supports uh, transportation infrastructure. So uh, we were pleased that there was a strong link there. The link was broken uh, in veto and uh, we're, we're hoping to um, reconnect those two important policy areas and uh, move forward. Perhaps that will be in a special session. I'm not sure what the odds of that are, maybe less than 50% at this point, but it, they remain nonetheless. Um, also, uh, another bit of infrastructure um, 
uh, development and uh, both in terms of funding and in policy is, is the CARB board. Uh, we're very pleased to see uh, the CARB board funded and to have the program codified and live on in perpetuity. Um, I know it wasn't uh, probably your preferred mechanism for funding it because I think it was PWB funds that $5 million that went into uh, that and I completely understand that. We're hey, not- James. Could you just say what the CARB board is only because oh, not everybody may know. All right. But well, yes, thank you for uh, uh, acknowledging <clears throat> where the money comes from. Yes, that's, I know, an important issue for the people on this call. Uh, it's the Community Aviation Revitalization Program, and it works with general aviation airports uh, in, in, a, in helping to fund uh, projects uh, that uh, are important to those uh, really vital uh, community assets. And um, I believe there are about, mm, I might get this number wrong, so don't punish me for that, but I think there are probably 32 ports with general aviation uh, airports, but there are many, many more than that around the state. So it is a diverse group. Um, and uh, this program uh, had not been established uh, permanently in statute until uh, this legislative session. And as I mentioned, the funding, the f uh, there's a $5 million um, uh, f funding for that program, which came from the PWB account, as I understand it. And I know that's not ideal. We're not, as I mentioned, participates in the, in the PWB account other than the broadband side, but we're, we're definitely interested in uh, the um, having a vigorous uh, infrastructure funding program in the state of Washington, the PWB is a great way to do that. Um, so probably in the future, we, that as a point of collaboration, that might be one where ports and the PWB could work together. Uh, I, I will also note that uh, CARB has a fantastic chair and they're very well led. Uh, so uh, we all have great, uh, uh, great ambitions for CARB. So uh, as JC Baldwin takes uh, the reins there, um, we will uh, work with her and, uh, and uh, be as helpful as we possibly can. Um, let's see, other things I might uh, touch on uh, that might be of interest. Um, the tax increment financing bill uh, that had uh, been around in various forms for over 20 years uh, uh, passed and uh, made Washington the 49th state in the union. Uh, only Arizona doesn't use TIF. We became the 49th state in the union to ad adopt a, uh, a <coughs> TIF uh, structure in law. And uh, this marks a significant uh, departure, uh, shift in uh, policy for the uh, state and how that is working. I'm sure that uh, that uh, law will be addressed in uh, future legislatures, probably not the coming one because it's brand new, but probably after that, uh, it might be modified over time. But that is a, that's a big, important tool. It's been used in sort of pilot programs uh, significantly in Wenatchee uh, and, and the Tri-Cities areas um, over time. And we're excited about possibilities for that. So those are some of the big successes. Uh, uh, that we're happy about. And um, uh, as far as next session, um, what's big on the ports list is uh, the transportation funding component, as I mentioned. Um, it is not uh, usual. Uh, the historic pre or, uh, experience does not uh, support the idea of passing a large transportation uh, package uh, in an election year, uh, yet we're hopeful that that could happen. And certainly uh, uh, front of mind for everybody uh, in this meeting and certainly for ports is the federal funding that remains uh, to be uh, allocated towards uh, a, a whole variety of things. And we're certainly hoping uh, many, many infrastructure uh, uh, projects. And uh, because of the um, the, the sort of dimension of those funds, the, the large amount of money, um, I'm hearing from uh, budget leaders that they are, they uh, certainly favor uh, uh, programs like the Public Works Board uh, as a mechanism for deciding uh, 
uh, which projects are most worthy of receiving that money. And I, and I think that's very sound public policy. So we're, we're supportive of that idea. And uh, that will be certainly something that uh, we'll be involved in in the coming session. And uh, that probably uh, is a good lead into uh, what um, perhaps ports and other stakeholders can work, uh, work on with the Public Works Board. Excellent, excellent comments there, James. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to working with ports. That's a question that we have uh, on, on our executive team is to consider whether and how uh, we consider bringing other partners onto the board. Um, and it's we're at the very, very beginnings of those conversations. And I know that it's been talked about, you know, off and on over the years, but uh, in, at least in my leadership, it, we, I haven't had those conversations yet, but it is something that we are going to start thinking about and talking about. So with that, um, let's jump to um, the, the three priorities uh, for the Public Works Board, which are there, and then a permanent source for broadband funding. If we could hear from Dawn and then um, from Stafford, and then we'll come back to you, James. And I was, uh, we have, we're about 20 minutes out before we need to wrap it up um, with this conversation. So if we can keep our comments to about three to five minutes, because I would like the opportunity for board members to be able to ask a couple questions. So please, um, Dawn. Thanks, Catherine. I, I can definitely keep my comments pretty short. Um, I, I really appreciate the use of the term aligning here. And um, one of the charges we got from the legislature last session was to work closely with Public Works Board and with CURB in aligning our policies um, around broadband funding. So when it comes to investing in infrastructure, we certainly will be walking side by side there and working closely to coordinate. Um, regarding financial sustainability, I think we're all kind of in the same boat when it comes to um, delivering on the expectations given to us by the legislature with the um, amount of funding that we received. And the better job we do with that, the, the more sustainable all of us are into the future. And I'll just leave it at that to give time for the other speakers. Thanks. Thank you, Don. So Stafford, please. Thank you. Yeah, when we talk about investing in infrastructure, I, I think it's good to target those areas that are of greatest need and that we're intended by the legislature, those last mile rural areas where grant dollars come in to subsidize uh, those areas to those who are truly in need, maybe where the return on investment uh, wasn't there. Um, and as a part of that, just noting the current grant program, it has strong overbuild protections, but also maybe to consider areas, because there's lots of federal funding and there's also state funding, but maybe to consider in overbuild protections, protecting also areas that have won federal funds where they're maybe currently building or sh going to build shortly that um, just haven't been built and up and running yet. Currently in the grant rules, the if you win a federal award, those are not as protected um, as existing infrastructure or infrastructure that might be uh, under construction. Uh, and when I, when I talk about financial sustainability or sustainability, especially in the broadband context, uh, the phrase that comes to my mind is future, future proof. You want to make sure that what uh, we build and what goes in is sustainable uh, with the coming trends of what might be coming with speeds and different technologies. Um, it's tough to predict the future, but to be as future proof uh, as you can and whatever that might be, I think could certainly be a discussion. Uh, to be had. And as, as far as permanent funding, excuse me, climate change. And when we think of climate change in the broadband context, broadband has is a great tool and a great opportunity to help with the issues of climate change that we're facing right now. Uh, just look at the pandemic and the, the side effect that we learned and broadband and how many people can work from home, um, what that did for some of the taking cars off the road, people not commuting into work as much. We kind of figured out how to work from home, how to be more effective in that sense. And it's not just working, but also in, in consumer goods, um, in shopping, you have less people out and about and traveling and moving. That's going to help with environmental issues. Um, and also telemedicine, noting telemedicine, not, not only has uh, helps with climate change, uh, but it also is a great service 
to those who can't get out. Uh, and there's a lot of telemedicine that can be done at home. And as we expand broadband, that's going to have that overarching effect on many. And a permanent funding source for broadband. Um, broadband and internet is certainly a part of our future into our foreseeable future. What's tough to predict again is, is what's going to happen over the next 10, 20 years with broadband. If, if we look in the past 10, 20 years and how far we've come and how much has changed, when we talk of a permanent funding source or rules or, or provisions that may be around that, it just may be important to consider being able to adapt to the changing tides or winds that come in. Um, but certainly investing in broadband and various funding sources, including a potential funding source would be something that uh, I, I think everybody in the broadband world would be supportive of. Excellent comments. I really am intrigued by your overbuild protection comment. Um, but maybe that will come with a question later on. So with that, um, James, if you would like to give your thoughts on uh, item C and D and the board, and then uh, Janae, if you are available and would like to make a comment or two from the uh, curb perspective as one of our uh, broadband partners, that would be appreciated. And hopefully we get still get some time for questions. So please, James. Please, James. Uh, well, certainly. Um... I would like to start off by quoting James Thurber, who said, uh, there's no safety in numbers or anything else. And uh, the idea of permanent uh, attached to the word funding um, uh, is, an, is you know, uh, a comforting thought, but uh, we've certainly experienced uh, um, the, the fact that uh, you have to continue uh, working hard to maintain uh, that kind of status. And as I mentioned earlier, MACA, which was created by the citizens of the state of Washington, you know, that feels a lot like a permanent uh, funding source. It, it is not. It is. It's it. The account remains there, but we have to work every year to make sure that it's maintained. And I think that uh, we will experience that in uh, the public work setting. And this is a great time to really, I think, uh, um, invigorate those conversations and uh, and make at least the sitting legislature feel like um, the word permanent should be attached to that. Uh, it doesn't bind future legislatures, but uh, uh, to the extent that th that idea is, is, you know, vigorously socialized uh, currently, I think it, it improves the chances of, of that. Um, uh, also, um, uh, you know, ports are not uh, part of your program, and uh, we we value what you do, and we're philosophically supportive of it. And if you ask any port director or any port lobbyist, you know, is the is the public works board doing good things? They will say absolutely. Um, and uh, we enjoy the broadband component of that, but we're not, uh, uh, you know, actively engaged in your discussion of a permanent funding source. Again, very supportive of the idea, but in terms of uh, lobbying uh, and the like, it's not, uh, it would not be a priority that I would anticipate um, this, uh, the trustees of this association adopting. Um, CURB is because uh, that is a program we're eligible for. And so we work every year uh, to make sure that um, the CURB program, uh, your sister agency is, uh, is uh, well supported. Um, it, you know, I, I welcome your discussions about um, uh, should ports be seated on the public works board and, and be part of uh, um, the program. And uh, it's an, it is an interesting discussion. Uh, I've, I personally have come before the Public Works Board, uh, perhaps before you were in the room, Catherine, and said, you know, this is something to think about. We're team players, we're municipal uh, governments, and we, we don't want a sh shoving match over this. So that, that's never going to happen. Uh, and if you want to collaborate and cooperate, we're team players. We're here to have the discussion. So uh, that offer remains open, and if we can be supportive in any way, I'm sure port, any number of port directors would like to have the conversation, and uh, I and my staff are also available for that. And uh, as far as the, uh, the funding for uh, permanent funding for broadband, um, 
uh, we, of course, are delighted to see uh, the amount of uh, federal funding come in. And um, uh, that's a very important part of the current formula. And we hope that continues into the future. Uh, the two bills um, that uh, addressed retail authority in the last session uh, change uh, the kind of access to federal programs, uh, at least in the exercise of that authority that we haven't had previously. That's un clearly unsettled law at this point. And I'm sure that uh, many of you paid attention to that drama. Uh, and I'm sure that we'll revisit that drama um, in the coming session. Every session has broadband drama. And uh, that's one of the reasons I, I, I like following um, uh, this issue area. Uh, but uh, we're supportive of seeing a lot of money uh, pushed into the PWB for that. You do great work in that space. And I would encourage the board to push that money out as fast as possible. Make that money active and come back and ask for more. Wonderful comments, James. Um, Diana, I'd like just to have Janae respond and then I'll call on you. So Janae, do you have any comments you'd like to make? We have about 10 minutes to go. I'd love to hear uh, as a sister agency or brother agency, whatever we want to call you, uh, or just a co-agency or co what, I don't know, no, not co-agency, but as uh, uh, Janae, do you have any comments? Um, I, I guess uh, I come from a totally different side, so I'm a little caught off guard because I was actually prepping for my board meeting next week. Um, you know, I think we just need to be a united front, which I have said you know, for the last couple of years about broadband, we all have the same mission about connectivity. It shouldn't be about um, being a bank and getting the dollars out the door. We need to be focused on what our community needs are and meeting them where they are and getting our communities connected in the most um, rural areas and building those public private partnerships between those communities and their ISPs. And so I look forward to working with PWB gearing up for next session and the broadband office um, in doing so. And as far as permanent funding goes, I, I don't, Curb doesn't have permanent funding, so I, I can't really speak for broadband <laughs> permanent funding, so. Thank you, Janae, appreciate it. And uh, thank if you for I, being put on the spot there. Uh, Diane, I, please. Oh, please, James. If I may, uh, um, Janae, those are great comments. Integration is, is very important, and I'm delighted to see that um, the state has chosen to create a broadband office because an integrated broadband perspective is very important. Uh, overbuild was mentioned, and that's a very touchy area because uh, technology advances and more modern technology overbuilds, you know, copper, et cetera. Uh, but uh, an integrating planning function that would uh, provide a united front, as Janae uh, uh, mentions, is a very important part of this um, of this setting and, and the success of the state and building out to the most underserved areas and the rural areas, uh, it really will rely on that kind of thinking to make it happen. So please, Diane. It'll really fast. Um, thanks, James, for sharing some of those ideas. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you to maybe propose something to us. Um, back in 1985, um, when the uh, Public Works Assistance Account was, was formed, those of us that are on the Public Works gave up some of our um, taxing authority when it came to the um, public utility tax to go into and start this fund. What would the ports recommend as far as a, uh, a funding source for broadband? What kind of taxing authority might, might you recommend that would be given up that could well, go in and help start this program? Um, so, uh, first of all, the, uh, the taxing, uh, I hate to use the word taxing authority because uh, uh, the trustees of this organization would fire me if we gave up any taxing authority, but you gave up, uh, you gave up some of your uh, money that you raised from the public utilities tax. Correct. And, uh, uh, we also pay public utilities tax. We develop, uh, what there, in fact, there is a gigantic water treatment plant uh, uh, that is um, in the works in Pasco right now and uh, for food processing. And uh, there is a similar project uh, in a water system at Sunnyside, Walla Walla and other places. Um, so uh, we're in the same kind of taxing space. 
also, um, I, I, I forgive me because I'm not as well schooled on the funding sources for a PWB, but is the public utilities tax still tied to funding uh, as a as a permanent connection for the public, it's been it's been uh, used for other uh, other sources, um, and and we are working to get it back a next session, I believe. I see. So, so yes, it's, it's so it's still in statute, but it's been temporarily diverted somewhere else. I see. Okay. I, so Diane, I hope did I answer your question? Not really, but uh, I I don't think this is not the first time you're going to hear that kind of question be asked back. You know, if you guys were to join us is to come up with some site, something that you would propose similar that all of us had to do back in the 1985. Uh, so you give it. So you're um, you pay a portion of your public utilities tax into uh, uh, the board. Yeah, that's correct. How about if we did the same thing? I I don't think that that's not a bad idea. So, no. I mean, I'd, I'm throwing that one out there is have right. maybe you guys propose something. And that might be something then that we could go to the legislature and say, hey, look, the ports sure. are doing this. We'd like to add them to the Public Works Assistance yeah. Account Board. I'm just thinking out loud. I, I'm in no way in a position. Oh, I know. <laughs> totally understand, James. Yeah. We're not holding you to the... Okay, good. This, we're not I holding a gun to your head. <laughs> WPPA trustees, I didn't commit us to anything. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the, the question, though, Diane. And thank yes. you for the frank conversation, James. Appreciate it. Gary, please. Member Rowe. Sure, question for Don. And I know this is something that you're talking with uh, public work board, public work board staff already, but one of the requirements in the legislative um, budget bill was coordination on uh, projects for federal funding. And the concern I have, I guess, is whether uh, applicants will have to apply for federal funding for the same project that they're applying for um, public works board funding to be able to do that coordination between the different programs to be able to decide whether a project is more su suitable for, for federal funding. It's, it's a little confusing reading the legislation and, and, and seeing how that's gonna be put, put to, to use. I appreciate the question. And um, I agree that the wording in the proviso is a little bit tricky because it was inserted right underneath our $50 million match for, for federal um, grant applications. But um, we're not seeing our coordination as, as solely limited to federally um, eligible projects. I think the more we can coordinate on all projects with Public Works Board and, and with CURB, the better off our communities will be. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Gary. We are just kind of in the beginnings of having the conversation around um, establishing that process and what the coordination will look like. So I don't have a lot of details yet, but we are definitely open to it and working on it. Yeah, so my follow on would be just the concern that applicants have to spend a considerable amount of money to put an application together. And I hate to see them having to put an application into both for a federal program as well as a state program to be able to do that coordination. I, that, that'd be my yeah. concern. I'm not seeing it that way. Okay. And um, I mentioned before that we um, have technical assistance available, free grant writing services available for local communities who do want to pursue federal funding. So we are also um, aware of the difficulties and the expense of, of preparing those applications and, and want to help with that as much as possible. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Gary. Are there uh, other questions from board members to this esteemed panel? Uh, and, and I say that with all, uh, oh, I guess I forgot. Nick, did I not ask you about the last two questions? I thought I did early on. I thought you did those before uh, James came on. Yeah, I um, think I, I covered those and happy yeah. happy to weigh in on any questions or uh, that, are, that, I can, that I can weigh in on. Mary Margaret, please. You have your hand raised, Mary Margaret. I'll turn my son. This may be my last opportunity to bring this up, but I think there ought to be a fee that everybody pays. And I like us to take a look at what happens at the 911, where we put a very, very small fee on television, tele, telephone service, which everybody pays for, which pays for it. It wouldn't pay for the whole thing, but it would give some funding for future. But that's just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. So small fee for to fund broadband. 
And that would go to all users. So when you look at your bill, you just have this little, you know, a penny or two that would mm -hmm. show up. Mm -hmm. the yeah, well, we all have to, I don't think everybody realizes that nothing is ever free. It comes from somewhere, but I think some people think free is really free, but it really does come from somewhere. Um, so thank you, Mary Margaret. Uh, any other uh, comments from board members or questions of this esteemed panel? I guess I'll ask one last question uh, since we heard from um, uh, James on uh, us considering putting um, or allowing or working on legislation that would consider ports. Uh, does Nicholas have any comments on whether uh, tribes have interest in being represented on the public works board or do you know, you may not know anything about that just because of uh, not necessarily working with us directly, but perhaps you have a, a thought on that. Yeah, th uh, thanks so much for the question. So I, I certainly um, can't speak for our, our tribes in, in Washington, um, but I think every, from, from my experience working at, at, the, at the state and at the federal level, I think um, not only tribal partnerships, any type of partnerships, um, you know, where there is synergy um, is, a, is a positive thing. I know that increased dialogue has never hurt, um, hurt in my own professional world um, in that regard. Um, but I think, you know, I'm not sure of, uh, the history and the ongoing communications that, uh, you and your board have had with tribes, but I would certainly encourage you all, um, to reach out to, um, organizations such as the affiliated tribes for Northwest Indians, uh, chairman, uh, Leonard Forsman, uh, is the president of that. And their executive director is Miss Terry Parr. Um, and it's a, um, it's a organization that represents, uh, the tribes in Washington, Idaho, Oregon, um, and some in Alaska. And I do think that that is a, a great conduit for conversation to have and for that dialogue to, to be shared. Um, again, in my experience, it never hurts to, to build bridges and to have those conversations, even if at the end of the day, um, a, a feasible partnership isn't in the best interests of either party. Um, but I would always encourage my philosophy is to always over communicate you know, as a, as a previous middle school teacher, that's what I would instill upon students as well as it doesn't hurt to have the conversation, um, even if you agree to, to disagree for lack of a better term. Perfect. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful advice. I totally agree with you on uh, over communication is better than under communication. Some people go, why do you repeat things, Catherine? Well, I'm not sure you heard it the first time. <laughs> so. Certainly. Yes, so totally agree with you. Well, I want to thank uh, James and Stafford and Nick and uh, Dawn all for participating today. Uh, I really appreciate your insights. I, hopefully we have great notes uh, to take this forward. Feel free to reach out at any time. Um, and well, you're welcome back at our committee meetings or our, our board meetings at any time. Um, uh, we learn from you, um, you know, a lot and hopefully uh, it, we can also uh, convey good information also. Um, anything else on this before we close off? Because I'd like just 10 minutes for the board to just, we had to rush through a few things. So with that being said, why don't we close um, on our broadband discussion and just come back to, um, we have about eight minutes, seven minutes of going, time flees. Um, uh, I don't know, Cindy, is there anything you want to say in specific on the budget or do we want to go back and talk about, um, is there any, uh, we didn't get an opportunity to talk about uh, the revenue streams or, um, and I know we ran through um, Karen's update. Yeah, no, mine Cindy. was more informational. I mean, I, you know, it's about the, you know, just reminding everybody what our RCWs are and um, what it will look like if those tax revenues come back to us next biennium. Do so you have a slide that you'd like to share? Especially it could be helpful. Okay. Um, in, in thinking... Jason? Yeah, which one do you want? Um, the, just the second one of that three, that, that one. Next. So mainly this one, um, 
the other one it is in your packet that it just lists all the RCWs that pertain to us, how the account was you know, created, how we have to do our interest rates and, and so that type of thing. This here shows what currently we are getting for our tax revenues and what is um, projected to be our tax revenues, um, assuming that they all come back to us. So it's a pretty good increase. And that was the public utility tax there that uh, Diane was mentioning with uh, 20 percent of water distribution, 50 percent of sewage collection. 20, I don't know exactly oh. what that means. What? And I think there's some mistake there. I think it's either it's 50 or 60 because I've got two on the two different oh, slides. Oh, two different, different slides, yeah. Um, but it's basically of the utility tax. So you're taxed on 20% of your water distribution and 60% of the sewage collection is what we, of the taxes collected, that's, I believe, the amount we get. Which is, it goes with a question that Diane raised. So right. um, does anybody have any questions on this or comments on this or anything they'd like to learn? Pam, please. Okay, thank you. Yes, and thank you, Cindy. That was that you only had a few slides there that you would have spoken to, but I think they were really valuable. Oh, and, the, the RCWs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can go back there. Well, no, th that's fine. I'm just saying thank you for including those yes. for anyone who wants to dive more deeply. But the last one with the what we're getting now and <laughs> what we would get, you know, what we'll get if they are the revenue streams are returned yeah i think is super important and i keep bringing up you know if we have more money maybe we should look at grants for some more needy um uh applicants and that would be made easier from, by going from 50 million to almost 335 million and yeah. so I encourage the future board to think about that. And I'm also looking forward, I don't know when it's scheduled, but uh, to something that shows where the money that's given, uh, that's authorized from the legislature, that I'm sorry, that the legislature um, requires some of the, our money to go to various places like general aviation and there are other ones and i know conservation I commission that. yeah and that's State something yeah. that you're really good about presenting in a format similar to this slide that to show us to remind us that not all of our money goes where we for regular infrastructure like we're thinking so right. thank you so i see mark has his hand raised please yeah, I'd just like to follow on what Pam just said. And I and I understand that the public works system account is kind of really based on this revolving uh, system of loans and then paying, you know, getting the monies through. But if at some point um, in the future, and I know this is very much in the future, you know, if if, if we are looking at getting this full revenue that was anticipated, I would agree with Pam that we should really start thinking about more grants than loans with parameters if possible. Um, I'm not sure how many board members, you know, deal with these uh, applications and loans. It is a struggle for a lot of cities, especially the smaller cities to deal with debt service. And there's usually a fairly robust conversation between the public works department and the finance department and the elected. Thank you, Mark. Um, do we want to extend 10 minutes? Do people have time to stay on 10 minutes extra? Even if it's a two or 3% loan, that's a, that, those can be very challenging conversations. So I think it's just important that if we have the ability in the future, um, grants make life much easier. So thank you. Please, Ed. Chair, I would make a motion to extend the meeting 10 minutes to complete the business agenda. Second. Is there a second? 
Second from Gary. And I see Geraldine has to leave. Are other people able to stay on an additional 10 minutes? It may even be less than 10 minutes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Okay, any nays? Great, thank you. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, other questions on the um, on Cindy's um, work and helping understanding our, our tax revenues or comments uh, following on on Mark or Pam's comments about uh, uh, considering grants. And I see Diane just, her face showed, so I know she wants to say something. I just want to thank Cindy for all that she does and helping make this um, clarifying the numbers. It's uh, so good and I, Catherine can uh, attest that having real clear communications goes so well when you talk to your legislators, don't they, Catherine? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Diane and I had a conversation about it a couple of days ago and we've had many conversations with our Senator Frock on it also. So we like to see his eyes go, whoa, <laughs> look at those numbers. Those numbers, how much money goes another direction? So Mr. Rowe, please. Uh, yes, in the, uh, I think in the next month's agenda, I think I thought I heard uh, Chair, excuse me, uh, uh, Kat, uh, Karen say something about uh, our funding request for the next buy -in, uh, next uh, budget year. And I guess yes. the question, I'm not, I don't need to do more detail now, but I guess it'd be, it'd be great to have an update on what the, the status of the fund is and whether we have additional revenue or, and fund balance that could be appropriated in the next budget year, whether we, whether we, what that number would be so we could get that information. Yes, that'd be helpful. Thank you, uh, Member Rowe. Um, any more comments on this? And then I, if there's anything that anybody would like to comment on our conversation with the broadband community, uh, I would love to hear those uh, comments and especially those from the committee, if they learned anything new or anything that they would like to, to uh, make sure that we hear on what they heard it would be appreciated. Um, so either the, the work Cindy has done or the, our recent conversation with the broadband, uh, our broadband participants would be helpful. Any thoughts out there? Okay, just a real I quick know, comment. It, it, you know, the idea of al aligning um, is a really important thing. And, and I, you know, I think this work is really being done right now um, as we speak, but it'd be nice to see the, the fruits of that work as soon as possible when we're trying to make decisions about which projects we fund and things like that. So I know the broadband committee has been talking with staff about that. So it's something that's important for the board to understand. Chair Garner, this is JC. Yes, please, so, JC. Thank you. To follow up on Gary's comments, um, getting that MOU in place between um, the broadband office and curb in the public works i think is of the utmost importance if you really want to ensure that synergy between the three groups that's uh, that's really important to do almost immediately yeah no i'd agree with you i have asked some questions about the status of it so um i don't think it's been forgotten but it definitely hasn't risen to the level of being worked on yet so appreciate that um any other thoughts on i i, I had a couple of ahas um in just in listening to the conversation one and I, I not being totally familiar with this but overbuild protection uh not as strong in the federal program i am very curious about that because we don't want to have um you know overbuilding anywhere if we especially if we have underbuildings el elsewhere um so not exactly sure how that could be addressed um i also think that what i also heard was um integrating the planning function and I'm not exactly sure if that's something the state broadband office will be doing and thinking about how to how to really know where broadband is needed and where it's lacking and where we're so we're not overbuilding. Um, so those are a couple of things that I heard. Um, I like uh, Mary Margaret's comment on uh, potentially a small a fee to help fund broadband. Uh, and uh, also it was interesting. Thank you, Diane, on uh, the ports paying a public utility. Uh, tax to go into the Public Works Board Fund if they came on the board. Um, so Karen, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I'm wondering if, uh, speaking of, of the, the continuum between the broadband office and 
Public Works Board and CURB regarding uh, how things flow from readiness, you know, building out the broadband action teams, doing planning work so that the construction investments are solid and sound and ready to go and achieve the outcomes that we want. Um, one of the things that uh, an MOU could do for us is align us behind a mapping function of, so that we can see visually where investments are being made and how connectivity is advancing across the state. Um, I think that's a shared interest that we have as programs is how do we visually represent the outcome of the investments. Um, and so I want to throw that in mind as a segue to if you want a, uh, an update for me on the sync meeting that took place yesterday, uh, because I flew, flew by that in the interest of time. And I'm happy to provide a quick update on that if um, the board like that. Yeah, I think we need to hear from Sheila and JC both have their hands raised okay, we, and we're great. still we're still running low on time. We have five minutes to go and I don't want to okay. extend the meeting. Okay. Uh, so Sheila uh, and then JC, because uh, I think it's really important to hear about the broadband piece. Yeah, so I, I just I wanted to address the what we're the concerns with what we're doing with the broadband committee and staff. Um, to prevent overbuild. And as you know, there is, um, there's a couple of things built into our statute that with the intent of avoiding overbuild, and that is the um, providing evidence that the area is unserved and also the ISP notification. And this cycle going forward, we're gonna be requiring more of applicants um, within that process. And we're also trying to align with CURB as much as we can in that process. So we're getting consistent information on um, the unserved area and we're expecting more out of, out of the applicants, not just, um, you know, did you contact the ISP, but did you bring them to the table? So, um, and then also with, with the intent of awarding projects that are ready to connect end users, that should help reduce the, the, the likelihood or the risk of awarding to, to an area that is, is gonna be an overbuild. Thank you, um, JC, please. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, I, I just wanna echo uh, Sheila's comments and Karen's, and actually I'll make a comment about or, or reinforce something Janae said when she had the opportunity to speak in that in that that this is one of the reasons I I'm so strong on this MOU is you know we don't want to be duplicating efforts we have three programs that can enhance and complement each other going forward to get to our end game which is really making sure that the, you know that these end users are getting broadband and Janae makes a good point it's not about who who has the money it's about who has it and what they can do with it to complement each other. And until that MOU is in place, we're not forcing ourselves to work together. And, uh, and unintentionally, I think maybe working at odds, unintentionally, certainly, but, um, but uh, I think it's very important to keep the end game in mind. And that's whatever we can do to expedite that person who doesn't have internet to be able to have their kids be able to go to school or work from home or just have any of the basic needs that, imp and, um, that that um, broadband provides as, as just basic infrastructure. So I have one more comment for Chris McCord and then I'm gonna call for the good of the order. So Chris, please. Thanks Chair. Uh, just to address that JC, we did uh, with the group meetings that we're having on a monthly basis, we we're getting more formal, almost a mini sync if you will, and Gary described and Ed described a desire for something like that at the committee level. And so in this past week's meeting, more formal agenda, some notes taken and facilitating, at least for now, with input from Janae, Don, and Karen. So we can be as coordinated as we possibly can. I think this will help us lead into that MOU if that's where we end up having to go. Um, so just want you all to be aware that we are communicating a pretty formal level now uh, in as it with also with patients as Don and Wes want to, to get their staffing levels taken care of. So just wanted you to be aware of that. So since we have uh, one minute to go, I want to uh, uh, close the meeting. But before I do that, I want to um, uh, 
apologize to Karen for not being able to get the sync update. We did get a brief sync update from um, Gary, so I appreciate that. And I'm sure that we will learn more. We need to add some time to the next agenda so we hear about sync. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of good work going on there. But I also want to give an extra, extra special thanks to all the departing board members. Um, JC, um, um, Diane, Pam, Bubba, um, gosh, I, I'm trying to, I know um, I, Eric's already um, hasn't participated today. Who else am I, who else am I missing? Um, uh, I think or do I have everybody else? Mary Margaret. Still... Mary Margaret. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. I, I don't have the list in front of me. I'm doing it from my head. So um, I wanna be sure to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think we will probably have a new board seated in August, uh, but still keep the date on your calendar if you are able, just in case uh, your seat isn't completed. Uh, JC, please, I do want you to, if you have a comment that you wanna say. I just forgot to take my hand down again. Sorry oh, well, just that. A, being that, the vice just, chair, I wanted you to have an opportunity to say something if you wanted um, to. Since you since you gave me the opportunity, I'll keep it brief. Um, it really has been an honor to be part of this board. Um, Y'all did good work in the state of Washington, and um, and it, and um, I'm just looking forward to seeing what you do uh, and what the new board does. I think you've got some great opportunities to start fresh in a lot of respects and actually some money to work with, which many of us that are leaving the board didn't have. And, um, and so this is, this is exciting for you. I'm really excited. I hope to see you when you come over into my neck of the woods in September. I hope you'll invite me to participate or at least, um, at least meet you for a few minutes for coffee or something. But uh, good luck to all of you. And thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been such a pleasure working with you as the vice chair. Does anybody have any comments um, they'd like to make for the good of the order? Okay, again, uh, thank you all to all the departing board members. Please keep it on your calendar in case we need you in August because we have, we'll be doing some awards of, of monies. So, uh, but we are expecting uh, the new board to be uh, predominantly seated by then. So thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Uh, thank you for uh, keeping the Public Works Board on your calendars and uh, looking forward to Oh, I, th I thank you all also to Ellen for her great work over the years too. Looking forward to seeing her in August, but realizing that she's also taking on a new role. So have a good, great, great weekend. And uh, thanks for being here today. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chair Gardo. Thank you. Recording stopped.